Good morning. My name is uh, Eli Nelken. I'm director of ELSEC. And my role here is to welcome you all. Mayor of Jerusalem, Moshe Leon, Hebrew University President Asher Cohen, His Excellency, Mr. Brabanti, the Italian amb ambassador for Israel, and his spouse, the scientific attaché, Mr. Ventura, and last but, but not, not least, our longtime friend, benefactor, and most honored guest, Viviana Kassam, and Tova and Sami Segol, ELSEC members, students, and guests. Welcome all to the first uh, meeting in a series of uh, a long, long series of meetings about emotions. Please, Viviana. Thank you. Well, first of all, I must tell you that it's very exciting to be here in presence. After such a long time doing Zoom, call, uh, Zoom uh, conferences, we risked, we say we'll do it, and Somebody up there helped us and protected us so that we can be here, and I'm very happy for this. Now, I welcome everybody. I won't repeat the names, but a special thanks to Tova and Sami Sagol. Thanks to them, the whole cycle of emotions have been possible. Uh, you know, great ideas don't come true if you don't have supporters. And very generously... I called Sami. Sami is a friend from a long time. We have this brain interest that links us together for many years. I said, Sami, I want to do this very big thing. And he said, how much? <laughs> so thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it, and I have no words to express it properly. Now, why emotions? Uh, I started thinking about it um, when I realized that being a woman I was always inviting men to be the speakers. You know, making big lists, and always men name came to my mind. And I said, I organized brain events since 10, 12 years. And at a certain point I said, why I have such few women? You know, and I'm so aware of women uh, needing to be, you know, in the focus. And then I tried to, wonder, I wondered why, and I thought that is probably, one, it's laziness. You know, we know men speaker. Uh, number two is uh, the fact that we try to have the stars, so press will come and newspaper will talk about it. And the stars are mostly men. So I said, I want to do something where I put the focus on women scientists. I did a research with a group of people, Mona Sorek helped me, and Idan Segev, and then other scientists. And we came up with 50 names of excellent women speakers. Uh, you know, uh, lab directors from Max Planck, Harvard University, um, MIT, Weizmann, Hebrew University. These women are fantastic, but they are not, you know, on the list of the famous people to invite on, uh, on, on brain meetings. And then I thought, what can we I don't want to make a ghetto, you know, have the conference for women. And so I thought that um, we should find a subject, a fil rouge uh, of that everybody would be involved in. And we decided to do the subject of emotions. Why emotions? First of all, I want to overturn the stereotype that emotions are only for women. You know, for 2,000 years, it was considered that women are victim of their emotions. They are uterine, they are hysterical, uh, they are passionate, and women cannot have the high rational thought. That is only for men. You know, from Aristotle's time, uh, only men can have philosophy, only men can have great thought. Women, ah, they are, you know, emotional. So I thought that to talk about emotion in eight cities all over the world, for eight conferences would help us overturn the stereotype and obviously having women talk about emotion is another uh, breaking the stereotype. Women have high rational thought and they can talk scientifically about emotions. Um, I'm wearing this coat tonight. 
uh, it's very visible, but I chose it especially for this conference. It's a Mondrian painting. Mondrian, in my opinion, is a perfect synthesis of emotion and rationality. It's a very rational painting that brings incredible emotions. Or it's a very emotional painting that's only rationality. You can decide what you prefer. And uh, we have found out in the last 30 years that emotions are not a negative characteristic of women. Emotions are incredibly important because um, they are necessary to acquire cognitive abilities. They are necessary in moral decision. They are necessary in all kinds of behavior and decision, even economy. And so we have, are revaluing the importance of emotions. And also I think that emotions are very, a very important tool for the challenges of the next millennium. You know, it is finished the time of conquer, aggressiveness, exploitation. Now, if we want to save our Earth, we need emotional competence and emotional intelligence. Think of immigration, think of sustainability, you know, think of peace. Uh, Rita Levi Montalcini, uh, to whom this whole cycle is dedicated, she was Jewish and Italian, then a Nobel Prize, and very tied to Israel. So I thought that she would be the emblem of what we want, the spirit we want to bring. And she used to say that giving access to women, to culture, uh, is the absolutely necessary because women have the greatest duty for the future is to imagine and create peace. And I think that this is something we all agree on and we want to bring it forward. And so we have women speakers, we talk about emotions, but this is also for men. Because I think that men culturally for a long time were not supposed to show their emotion. A real man doesn't cry, a real man is strong, a real man doesn't show emotions. We know now that emotions are necessary. And I give you a little example. Um, we will have, in each city, we have a different topic. Now, we start in Jerusalem, and I'm so proud and happy to be here in my university. Uh, Hebrew University, to me, is a second home. And, uh, and so, you know, I couldn't think of a better place to have the inauguration. Uh, so, um, in, in, in every city, here we'll be understanding emotion. We start with understanding emotion. Then we'll go on with beauty and emotion, gender and emotion, love, you know, in all the, in every city, moral decision. And there is, uh, I was talking to one scientist who is uh, uh, studying uh, maternal and paternal love, okay? And it's interesting because um, the maternal love uh, is uh, due to a protein which is called oxytocin that is developed by the women while we, they are pregnant. But they found out that men also develop oxytocin and they develop it when? When they are in touch with the baby. In the old times, men were not in touch with the babies. A real man would not change the diaper, a real man would not feed the baby, a real man would not hold the baby. Men did not develop oxytocin. They were terrible fathers, you know, two, three generations ago. I, have, I am, was blessed with a very loving father, but he had no relationship, physical relationship with us. He thought that his duty was to provide for the family and not to be holding his children. The young generation, they are incredible. They are incredible fathers, why? Because they start being involved since pregnancy with the wife and with the baby, they are in the delivery room. They hold the baby as soon as the baby is born. And they develop oxytocin and they are great fathers. I have a wonderful son and I tell him, I wish I was not your mother, I was your daughter. <laughs> and with this, I am ready to give the microphone to our president, Asher Cohen. Thank you, Asher, so much for being with us. I'm very, very honored that you came. It is a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to risk myself and mention some of the names and apologize in advance for those that I don't mention. Uh, 
my friend, the mayor of Jerusalem, Moshe Leon, Sami and Tova Segol, uh, the ambassador, the new ambassador of Italy, uh, the director of uh, ELSEC, and many others. I actually, uh, there is also, I know that there is a special t-shirt that was designed by Michal Rovner, who is here as well. Michal is a great friend of the Hebrew University and a personal friend as well. So I'm happy to see you as well here and many others. This is really an interesting and important conference for a number of reasons. First of all, it's done at the Hebrew University. That must be important in it by itself. I know that I'm a little bit biased, but it's still important, and so I'll mention that at first. Um, and of course, we are so very proud that Viviana organized it for us. Viviana, yet another great project of yours. It's important because it starts what we should have done long ago, and now we are doing more and more, not enough, but we should do, and we will do more and more, and that to celebrate women scientists. Uh, we all know that the world was built in a different way. It was built in such a way that at the forefront were always men. I always say that when we recruit people and we neglect 50% of the population, we cannot do it well. And nowadays, at least, we are trying to change it and we are moving in the direction of changing it so that we will have as many famous women as men, as should be the case. The women that we'll talk today are all top-notch scientists. I even know well some of them. And it's just an example. So it's a good initiative to celebrate that. And hopefully, we will not need in a few years to celebrate it anymore. It will be a natural extension uh, of what science is about. And emotion. When I grew up some years ago, when I grew up some years ago, there was very little science about emotion. Because it's a strange thing. You know, scientists deal with logical reasoning for, mo for the most part. And emotion don't always work with that. But that has changed as well. And in the last few decades, we have more and more research on emotion as well. And we now understand it more than we did. And hopefully, we'll hear more about some of it. So the combination of celebrating women scientists and advancing a field that is now at the forefront of brain science, but in the past was less so, is a good combination, Viviana. And thank you for doing that. I'm told that I have to speak for 10 minutes, but I actually ran my course. <laughs> so I'm left with a simple thing. To thank you all for coming here and to wish that we all enjoy the conference. Thank you. And of course, it's a pleasure to invite uh, the mayor of Jerusalem, Mar Moshe Leon, a great friend of the Hebrew University, and in my opinion, a great mayor as well. President, President of the University, Professor Asher Cohen, dear ambassador, Sergio, Barbenetti, yes. Professor Eli Nalken, Sami and 
טובה סגול היקרים, The President of the Jerusalem Fund, Mr. Shai Doron, and Ms. Viviana Kassam, Laura Vorton, is a member of the management of the city. Dear friends, I must tell you something emotionally, because we are talking about emotion. You know, there are a lot of conferences in Jerusalem, and uh, when I'm sitting in a conference like this, with a lot of scientists, I feel so small next to you. And I so appreciate you because I think to be a scientist is a great job and is a very important job for the future of the humanity. So, first of all, I would like to thank you that you come here to Jerusalem. And uh, I think that there is no any city that you, you can talk about emotion more than Jerusalem. Because when you enter to Jerusalem, when you are a mayor of Jerusalem, all the day you are a lot, we are with a lot of emotions. So I would like to wish you that uh, you will enjoy here and uh, also come to visit the city between the meetings, and uh, I bless you a uh, full success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mayor. So I would like to invite to the podium uh, the ambassador of Italy, the new ambassador of Italy, Mr. Sergio Barbanti. Thank you very much for coming. Good morning, Honorable Mayor of Jerusalem, <laughs> Moshe Leon, President of the Hebrew University, Professor Asher Cohen, Professor Segev, Mr. and Mrs. Sagol, Mrs. Viviana Kassam. Now coming here came to my mind something which happened over 20 years ago. Uh, I was posted to Washington DC, that was a second uh, post, foreign posting in my career. And uh, at a party, an evening, uh, I remember that distinctively uh, because I thought about this many other times. A Greek opera singer, whom I just met and I was talking to her, asked me, why are you diplomats always so emotionally constipated? Those were the exact words that she used. I never forgot that. Now, uh, I hope that she didn't mean that uh, to me. Probably uh, she told it to me because she thought that I could give an, uh, an honest answer to that question, but she posed the question. No, I don't want to go into the relations between emotions and diplomacy, because that would be a long story, but it cannot exist diplomacy without emotions. What I recall also is a very beautiful passage in Plato's Phaedrus, the allegory of the chariot. I, probably some of you remember it. He describes the soul as a chariot uh, pulled by two horses, a black one and a white one, with a charioteer. Now, the black horse are the low negative passions, the white horse represents uh, the noble higher passions, the charioteer is reason. Uh, then he describes all the tension towards the periuranium and so on, I won't get into that. But at the end, I thought also thanks to this uh, question that this woman asked me. And then this is what life is about, us dealing with passions. We can ignore the question, but we cannot ignore the issue, because the issue is part of our lives. It's one of the dominant parts of our life. In my life, personally, also, uh, 
due to my job, I always tried to be uh, a good chariot, and, uh, but without giving reason too much of, of a power in, in driving me and in driving also me in my profession. Just to mention one thing regarding this, friendship. Uh, a diplomat is supposed to foster cordial and friendly and friendly relations between the countries. If we don't know what friendship is about, how can we do it? It's not an abstract meaning. And this is why we live in the countries now. If I, I should establish a friendly relation with a person, not with an abstract concept. And this is an emotion, or this is a feeling, which is the evolution of an emotion. And uh, uh, Viviana earlier mentioned uh, Aristotle. I mean, he thought that friendship is the basis of life, the basis of uh, human relation. Just I wanted to give you before I read my speech something to tell you how important are, in my view, emotions in life, how important it is to direct them, to give them a meaning and to base them upon values otherwise they are just you are just a victim of emotions and that is also to be uh, avoided and then our stage was impulses when we are very very young emotions especially when we are adolescents and then feelings when we can give a direction to that now this symposium dedicated to rita levi montalcini has the intent to promote science for women, as Vivi just said, following the roles traced by the Italian Nobel Prize laureate. I congratulate Viviana Cassam for having conceived and organized emotions as a step on the path towards women empowerment in science as envisaged by Levi Montalcini. The event of today thus occupies an outstanding place among the cultural and scientific initiatives that connect Italy and Israel. So this is what I would like really to underline. This is not something out of the blue. This is something which comes from a long time commitment, but is also something which is part of a wider picture of relations between our two countries. An impressive number of Israeli medical doctors, architects, designers and scientists are graduates of Italian universities. After spending years at our best academic and research institutions, they return here as unofficial but wholehearted ambassadors of Italy to Israel. I'm so happy to be here in Israel. I've been here only for 10 days, but I can assure you, every person I met when knew that I am the ambassador of Italy smiled and that's something nice to say so it is a really a great privilege to be posted in such a country which is something also what i wished very much so it's no surprise in addition of course the active community of italian researchers living and working in israel is continuously growing and has a very recently formally organized a non-profit organization under israeli law carrying the name of aissi the association of italian scientists and scholars in israel so we have both ways is already coming to italy and then come back here and Italians coming here and uh, up to the point that they form this association. The cooperation and mutual appreciation between Italian and Israeli university, research foundations, companies and governmental agencies has been growing in all fields and has been formalized into a bilateral government to government agreement on research and development in the industrial, scientific and technological field. We have also talking about Rita Levi Montalcini since 2008 a fellowship for senior scholars entitled to scientists for the reciprocal exchange of eminent scientists, one from Italy and one from Israel. This instrument has gained a growing interest in academic circles as it truly allows a sort of academic absorption. Let me quote Livia Lita Levi Montalcini. I tell young people, do not think of yourself, think of others. 
Think of the future that awaits you. Think about what you can do and do not fear anything. Her fierce, independent, clear voice has been echoing her achievements and her achievements and the achievements of those women who followed her example. One of the most mesmerizing things about uh, Levi Montalcini is the fact that having faced so many obstacles herself, she spent most of the latter part of her career ensuring that other scientists have access to funds, equipment and support. For example, she founded as well and was the first director of the Institute of Cell Biology in Rome. She founded the European Brain Research Institute in 2002. She also established the Rita Levi Montalcini Foundation to provide African women with the tools for a full development of their capabilities. Her belief, expressed over and over again in the interviews and speeches, is that progress depends on our brain that the most important part of our brain, the neocortical, must be used to help others, not just to make discoveries. This is Viviana's Kassam, life mission. Well, the last years have demonstrated beyond any doubt that the human spirit is capable of dealing with enormous challenges, both physical and emotional, as long as it has science by its side on one side and solidarity on the other. Going back to what this uh, Greek opera singer told me so many years ago, I'd like to quote the Irish poet W. B. Yeats, who in 1919 warned us. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Let's be careful here. So I really hope that events like this and the others which will follow will teach also the best to be full of passionate intensity. This is what we need. A number of you are living evidence of this referring especially to our friends. So, and this is what I think we should uh, teach children. Education should teach also the best to be full of passionate intensity. This is a way to look uh, at the future uh, in this passionate intensity to develop social emotions. For example, gratitude, which binds people together. And this gratitude that I would like to express today to the organizers of this event and to those who are attending here today and to all women who are participating in this and who are not participating in this event, but they are working towards the aim of this, uh, of this effort. I'm not a woman, but... Uh, I never forget, doesn't it gay goes by without me remembering that I was made by a woman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before we start, so my name is Idan Segev, I'm part of uh, the, the center here. And uh, before we start uh, this, the session, uh, the meeting, I would like to invite uh, uh, Daniel Hoffman, the violinist, from Amer American Israeli violinist, but also to say that uh, ELSEC, our center, has, a, has an ethos of trying to connect brain and art. I'll tell you a little bit about that when I uh, will, will give my little uh, talk here. Uh, we feel that art and the brain research and research in general should go together for many reasons. One of the reasons is to connect emotionally to what you do rather than only intellectually. I'll, I'll say a few words about that in, in my 10 minute speech, but Daniel, it's your turn now.
Daniel, what did we hear? Part of what you heard was improvised, and part of it was a uh, doina that I wrote. If anybody, a uh, doina. Doina is, uh, comes from uh, Romanian uh, Jewish music. It's kind of a free-flowing uh, melody related to the Ottoman taksim. Um, the rest was just uh, improvised. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay, so yeah, please come in. See. So before we start, I just wanted to say, to tell you to say a few words, personal words, uh, about emotions. First, I want to say to all of you, uh, men have emotions. <laughs> it's not because we have six speakers and not a speaker men, we don't have emotions. And actually, uh, to tell you a, a, a several personal stories about emotions, so my, my grandfather was a playwright and a poet. And uh, when he was very old, he called me to his, to his room, to the hospital, to tell me something about myself. He said, I wrote a, a new, this, uh, this book, this, he wrote a book with short stories. One of the short stories was uh, Don't Cry. The name of the story was Don't Cry. And uh, he told me, I want to tell, and, and, and the story is about a, a, a young girl and the mother who was very sick and, and so forth, and, and, and the parents do not allow the girl to, tr to cry and so on. But he told me, actually, the story is about you, about me. Your parents really did not allow you to cry. It was not allowed to cry. I was quite shocked because I thought of myself as a very emotional person, but I didn't realize until this point that I am not allowed to cry. And I never cried, actually. Uh, it was something uh, asur, forbidden, especially as a soldier and so forth. So that's one aspect. I was really shocked and I realized that something is absolutely wrong in my interaction with the world, and I also built a whole ethos that I am very emotional, but I never cried. So that one aspect of my own personal difficulties with expressing emotions. Another story is about Michal Rovner, who is here, as was mentioned, our really absolutely greatest artist, uh, I think, ever in Israel, a video artist and a very good friend, and she was with us, Michal, in a meeting in Amsterdam some three years ago, or four already in Amsterdam, a brain circle, something that we do for the general public and for people who love the brain. We meet in the weekend and we discuss brain aspects. This was in Amsterdam. We do it in, a, in, a, in interesting places and, and we had a very serious uh, talk about machine learning and the future of science. It was very intellectual and very deep discussions and Michal said at the end, she was part of the discussion, but what about emotions? What about the machines that you build? Will they be emotional machines? We never mentioned the word emotions in all this meeting. It was Michal. So, so that's another aspect that we are limited. Scientists are very limited with our own kind of structure. I cannot start crying here because people say, well, what is con how is it connected to science? Why do you, uh, you express your feelings? And, and, the, and the most interesting thing for me happened about uh, six, six or less, four months ago, we had a meeting, as we said, our center is, likes to, to, to make connections with artists, and we had a meeting together with Eli and others here in Kabri, Kibbutz Kabri, with 10 poets and 10 brain scientists from ELSEC. We discussed different things. Poet wrote, uh, read their poems, and we discussed our science and so forth. And so forth. But the poets are very well connected to the, to the, to the, to the emotions, and, and some of them discussed things that are the seed of the, of the, of the piece of poem. They love and the, and the loss and the pain and the, and the motherhood and the fatherhood. They were very, very connected directly while they read poems. And suddenly I see a few of scientists start to weep a little bit, a little bit, and even more. And this was a complete release. This was the most amazing meeting. I'm sure everybody will agree that was there because there was this other aspect. Suddenly scientists became emotional. They discussed how the science, how they became scientists, how is it connected to their emotion. Suddenly it became broad. It was not as limited as we usually do. And since then, some of our scientists start a lecture with a poem. Some starts with saying about the fact that they are now not in a good shape. They express their emotions. I think this was a big shift, at least for me, I'm sure for others. 
So that's why we really should meet people from another culture, artists in this case, because they don't have any difficulty with expressing emotions and we are pack of emotions. Actually, we are mostly emotions. The intellectual part is really, really, really very thin. Most of us is a volcano of emotions which we try to suppress most of the time in order to behave, so to speak. It's very good to be able to express it, to go through psychoanalysis, to go through understanding yourself. It will broaden your doings in all fields, also in science. My own interactions with the emotions came from a very interesting book that I highly recommend. The first book ever that I saw a neuroscientist, biophysicist, somebody who's looking at the hardware, so to speak, of the brain and wrote a very interesting book. It's called The Emotional Brain. I think it's the first book by Joseph Ledoux who opened the field, so to speak, legitimately to discuss emotions on a technical level, so to speak. Yeah? Which, wh where are emotions in your brain? What kind of mechanisms, synaptic activity, chemicals are involved in emotions? So it's a very important book. And later he wrote the second book, The Synaptic Self. So these two books by Joseph Ledoux, for me at least, were the initiation of the legitimacy of neuroscientists, as you will hear today, brain scientists and, and psychologists and psychophysicists to discuss uh, emotions from the perspective of brain. So I highly recommend as a seed to understand emotions to read the books of uh, Joseph Ledoux. And I want to end by saying that uh, three years ago, Four years ago, when we inaugurated the center, the building, we had a very beautiful meeting here. It's called What Makes Us Human? What is unique about the human brain relative to other animals? What makes us so unique intellectually, cognitively, emotionally, and so forth? What makes us human? It was a very, very, very good meeting for three days. And by the end of the meeting, when I ended this meeting, I said, I really wish that the next meeting I didn't know about the corona, but I thought that within a year or two, we should do another big meeting, worldwide meeting about emotions. I felt that's the next topic related to what makes us human, our emotions. So here it happens. This is Viviana, who took the challenge to do it not only here, but in eight cities in Rome and Geneva and so forth. Thank you very much, Viviana, for that. Thank you very much, Sami, for grasping the fact that emotions and brain are really key topic. We really should understand this aspect. Thank you very much, all of, us for, all of you, for coming. Let's start with the next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Maya Tamir. Maya Tamir is a professor at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, Department of Psychology. Maya, it's your turn. <laughs> One thing I want to say, uh, so I asked all the speakers to speak for 20 minutes. There will be five minutes for questions. So please, if you feel free and you want to ask questions, I will really ask the, the speakers to limit their talk for 20 minutes so we shall have a lively discussion rather than a monologue. And later we shall have also a roundtable discussion uh, at the end of the meeting. Maya. Okay. Um, thank you, Idan. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, I want to, uh, first of all, thank Vivian Oh, it's um, very exciting to be part of this incredible international series. Um, and it's particularly exciting to me to join this incredible group of scientists who will be speaking today. I have two daughters, and when they were little, I used to read them stories. And one of my favorite stories was the story about Ferdinand the Bull. And those of you who don't know this story, uh, Ferdinand was big and strong, um, and so everybody expected him to fight in the bull rings. But deep inside, he was sweet and gentle, and what he really liked was to lie in the grass and smell the flowers. And one reason why I love this story is because it teaches us the dangers of thinking about things in essentialist terms. Thinking about things that they are carved by nature, that they are as they are, and that they're going to stay like this forever. And emotions, too, have often been considered in essentialist terms. And this is reflected in work by Paul Ekman, for instance, who argues that emotions are consistently captured by fixed and universal patterns of facial expressions. It's expressed in our popular cultures, 
For instance, uh, the movie, Pixar, the movie um, Inside Out uh, that depicts emotions in highly stereotypical terms, and it's even reflected in our language, uh, in figures of speech. But is that what emotions really are like? Um, what are emotions, and can we handle them? So I have the privilege to open today's uh, speaker series. And so I thought that I would stick to the basics. And what I would do is share with you some of the lessons that I've learned, having studied emotions for a while, in the hope that they might be useful to you. Inspired by dear old Ferdinand, I will refer to anger as a prototypical emotion and one that we often wish we could control. So here's lesson number one, and it's probably the most important lesson, and that is that emotions are aha moments. We all have at least some experience with emotions. Uh, think, for instance, um, back to the last time you were driving, anywhere really, but in big cities like Jerusalem or London or Rome, and think to that moment when the person right um, next to you was driving way too fast or way too slow, when they were cutting you off, or my personal favorite, when they were starting to drive in reverse on the highway because they've missed their exit. Those are the moments when we feel the blood rushing in our veins and we feel like we're about to explode. And yes, anger often feels like a raging bull um, that's um, running amok and uh, wreaks havoc everywhere. And emotions typically feel like these primitive remnants of our evolutionary past that are triggered automatically and take over. But what I would like to argue is that they're not. Um, instead, emotions are instances in which our brains try to make sense of the world around us. So our brains are meaning-making machines. They are designed to predict the future and help us orient our actions accordingly. Um, when our brains um, make um, sense of the things around us by using emotion concepts, that's when we experience emotions. So emotions are not these fixed, um, pre-packaged programs, but instead, emotions are instances of meaning-making. They are times when our brains try to predict the future using emotion concepts to help us uh, achieve our goals. Emotions, in the way, are tools to help guide us in the right direction. What do I mean by meaning-making? If you look at this picture, you might be wondering what you're looking at if you don't already know it. But if I say duck, then all of a sudden, huh, you understand what it is that you're looking at. Now, these are instances in which semantic concepts help us make sense of perceptual information. Of course, emotions are very, very complex situations. Um, but we can, right, they're, they're complex because they involve information com coming from multiple directions. Information from our senses, information from our bodies, information from the environment, from the situation. And that's combined with our prior knowledge, our prior learning history, our knowledge of emotions. But when we use emotion concepts to make sense of all of this, this is when we experience emotions. And then when we have anger and experience it, all of a sudden, it wraps everything together and gives meaning to the situation. This is what Lisa Feldman Barrett calls the theory of constructed emotion. And it's a really powerful theory. And one of the main um, uh, take-home messages of this theory is that emotions are not natural entities. Instead, they are moments of insight. They're moments in which we can make sense of the world um, and guide us toward action. Lesson number two is that emotions guide, but they do not determine our actions. And yes, when we think about emotions as entities, we think about them as something that has been developed throughout evolution to help us cope with these challenges that we've encountered over time. So the anger that you feel when somebody cuts you off in the road may be very similar to the anger that your ancestors felt when their piece of mammoth meat was stolen, right? And in both cases, the idea is that anger there to make us fight. And inspired by this idea a while back, we wanted to see whether anger, in fact, leads to aggression. What we did in the lab is we had people play a game that had a very aggressive goal. Um, participants needed to kill virtual enemies. Um, and before they played the game, we randomly assigned them to conditions so that some participants were led to feel angry, 
by listening to anger music, and some participants were led to feel calm by listening to calm music, and some were made to feel excited by listening to exciting music. And we wanted to know who will kill the most enemies in the game. What we discovered is that the people who were most aggressive were the angry people. Now, wait a minute, doesn't that actually mean that anger is deterministic? Well, I would argue that the answer is no, because aha moments don't determine action. Instead, what they do is they give us insight. They give us information that we can then use in creative and dynamic ways, in ways that are consistent with the situation they're in, in ways that are consistent to our goals and to our specific expectations. If we expect anger to make us fight, then maybe, yes, anger will make us fight. But we can also expect anger to influence us in a variety of other ways, and then perhaps the impact of anger might be different. In the study that I just told you about, it turns out that most of our participants, in fact, expected anger to make them more aggressive, right? Wouldn't you? Um, and then their predictions were confirmed. What we wanted to know is whether anger, in fact, leads to aggression by definition, or whether it operates in ways that are consistent with our expectations. So to test this, we repeated this study. Again, we asked participants to play a computer game and kill as many virtual enemies as they could. We randomly assigned participants before the game to emotion induction, so we made some people feel angry before they played the game, and we made some people feel calm before they played the game. But in this particular study, we added a component. Before we influence their emotions, we influence their expectations about emotions. So we gave some people information suggesting that anger might enhance their performance in the aggressive game. And we gave other people information suggesting that calmness might actually enhance their performance in the game. And the question is, who would perform better? Now, if anger is there, designed by e our evolutionary past to make us more aggressive, it should really matter what our uh, expectations are, right? Okay. What we found is that the people who killed um, the most enemies were angry people. But only to the expect that they expected anger to help them play better. And in fact, participants who were calm also were very effective in killing virtual enemies to the extent they expected calmness to help them play better in the game. And what that means is that emotions do in fact shape and influence our behavior, but not in deterministic ways, but rather in ways that are dynamic and creative and are consistent with what we would expect. Lesson number three is that we can manage our emotions. Um, we know that we can manipulate and influence aha moments in general. Um, for instance, we can change the way that we see the world by changing the concepts that we use. Um, there you go. All of a sudden, the world has changed. Of course, emotions um, are very unique aha moments. They are typically intense. They are embodied, uh, and they're often unruly. But I would argue that we can, in fact, grab the bull by its horns, so to speak. For instance, we can change our emotions by using different concepts, um, different emotion concepts. We can change our emotions. It is hard, and it takes practice and skill, um, but we can do it. I think the question is, how can we manage our emotions wisely? And here I have another lesson to share. Um, and that is that we can, make, uh, we can manage our emotions to feel better, but we can also manage our emotions to do better. If emotions are moments of insight, we can use it um, in creative ways, depending on what's important to us. For instance, we can amplify our anger and ride it all the way to war, if this is what we want. We can tame our anger um, and decrease it, either to feel better or to gain control. We can use anger to energize us to find non-aggressive solutions um, to our problems. And we can use anger to influence other people and maybe collectively work together um, to achieve our goals. Um, in our research, we have often found that people strive to feel emotions, not necessarily because they feel good, but rather because they can help them achieve whatever goals are important to them. So people who are in a, in a negotiation situation, those who want to gain the upper hand are motivated to amplify their anger before the negotiation. Those who want to maintain long-term long -term relationships uh, do not. 
People whose political ideology emphasizes power hierarchies are motivated to feel anger toward members of the outgroup, uh, whereas people whose political ideology emphasizes equality do not. And what's interesting is that when we look around the world, we know that people typically feel different emotions and we know that they strive for different emotions around the world. But to the extent that individuals um, endorse values like um, dominance and achievement, they want to feel more pride, but they also want to feel more anger and contempt. And people who value um, things like universalism and benevolence want to feel more love, empathy, and compassion. So people use their emotions and strive for emotions that are consistent with what they value. Um, but I have another lesson to share, and that is that people can manage their emotions, um, but only when it's called for. Um, sure, we've all experienced those situations where we wish we could be stoic, myself included, when we wish we could uh, turn off our emotions, right, hit the pause button, lower the volume, but um, if emotions are moments of insight, um, wouldn't we want to listen and learn from that insightful information sometimes? Um, I would argue that the answer is yes. In a recent study uh, done with Elise Calacarinos in Melbourne, we wanted to know how often in daily life do people actually try to regulate their emotions, especially when they're feeling um, emotional distress. To test this, we um, approached a group of Belgian students the week after they got their grades um, of the first semester exams. These are very difficult exams. 85% of our sample failed at least one, and many students failed more, so these students were pretty miserable. And we wanted to see how often these miserable students were trying to get rid of these negative emotions. Now, of course, people who didn't fail any exams uh, rarely tried to decrease their negative emotions. But the question is, what happens with those people who failed many exams? How often did they regulate their emotions? Um, do I hear 100%? Maybe just 50% of the time? The answer is 15%. Yes, you heard me right. Only 15% of the time. Now you may say, what's the matter with these people? Were they too um, um, uh, miserable? Were they not miserable enough? Maybe they were just really an odd <laughs> bunch of folks. And I would say, no, they're entirely normal because emotion regulation is rare. Um, it's rare because most of the time our emotions provide us with insightful information and we attend to it. It's only under certain circumstances where we actually need to manage our emotions. What are those uh, certain circumstances? Let me offer a few pointers. First, there are times when our emotions provide us with um, inaccurate insight. When we feel anger, but actually we should be feeling another emotion, or when we feel very intense anger, when in fact we should only be feeling uh, a little bit. When our emotions provide us insight that is inaccurate, um, that's when we want to manage our emotions. Sometimes um, the benefits that we could glean from our emotions are no longer relevant. It could be because um, the effects of emotions are potentially blocked or because they're inappropriate or irrelevant. Um, when our emotions provide us can, can't help us anymore, that's when we may want to manage it. Um, for instance, um, Iris Moss from Berkeley um, has done this beautiful study where she examined associations between emotion regulation and psychological well-being. She examined this in a group of women who um, experienced stressful life events. Some of these events were controllable. For instance, you could be in an abusive relationship and you can still pack up your bags and leave. Um, some of these situations were uncontrollable. For instance, you have experienced a natural disaster and you can no longer do anything about it. What she found is that emotion regulation was beneficial when people were experiencing uncontrollable events. But when people were experiencing events that they could still control, emotion regulation was no longer beneficial. And this is potentially because people were getting this important, insightful information from their emotions that they were no longer paying attention to. 
So when our emotions are potentially no longer useful, we may want to manage them. And finally, um, emotions influence us, obviously, but they also influence people around us. And to the extent that our emotions can hurt others, I argue that we may want to manage them then as well. Together with Eran Halperin, we have been studying emotion regulation in the context of intergroup conflicts. We found that there are people who get very angry in political context, but they're not motivated to change their anger at all. And those individuals um, let their anger rise and play out. Um, they are then more likely to uh, support aggressive policies and less likely to tolerate and listen to the other. When we convince people that maybe anger should be subdued in that context, they then express less intolerance and are more likely to listen and work with others to resolve the conflict. So I would argue that we want to manage our emotions also to influence um, to benefit other people. So we should manage emotions uh, sometimes, but, um, but not always. The last lesson that I have to share is one that took me a while to learn. Um, I am an emotion researcher, I, mia culpa. Um, and I um, share the stage today with um, some brilliant emotion researchers. And I'm speaking at a forum on emotions to an audience who is here hopefully to learn about emotions. So for us, emotion is at the center of the universe. But um, if we take a step back, we might actually realize that emotions are just one tool or one signal um, in the richness that is our mental universe. And in other cultures, people may not give that much attention to emotion and also acknowledge other sources of input. Um, in COVID-19, people around the world were experiencing a lot of emotional distress. We wanted to know whether people around the world were equally motivated to rid themselves of their negative emotions. What we found is that people in Western countries like the US or the UK or Germany really wanted not to feel any negative emotions at all. They were more attentive to their emotions and they invested more effort in getting rid of them. But people in uh, East Asian countries like Japan or China or South Korea uh, were less motivated to decrease their negative emotions and in fact attended to them less. And it's kind of interesting because when we think about collectivism, um, we think about it as synonymous with conformity, right? We think that people in Japan or in China all act the same. Um, but the thing is, that research on social conformity has typically focused on uh, norms for behavior, right? How we should behave. But what about norms for emotion, right? How we should be feeling. So together with Alon Vishkin, who's a former doctoral student of mine, we recently discovered that when it comes to emotion norms, the things are actually reversed. So people in individualistic cultures um, are more similar to each other emotionally. They strive to more similar emotions. And when their own emotions are different from the prototypical or average emotion in their culture, they actually feel worse. So emotion conformity is actually higher in individualistic than in collectivistic cultures. Why might that be? Well, I can only speculate at this point, but it could be that in individualistic cultures, what really matters is what goes on within the individual. And so signals that are internal and subjective really matter. In collectivistic cultures, what matters is what goes on between individuals. And so perhaps in those cultures, um, signals that are external and objective may matter a little bit more. So emotions are important, but just how important they are may differ across cultures. So just to briefly summarize, um, emotions are aha moments. There are moments in which we um, gain insight and try to understand what's going on around us using emotion concepts to guide our behavior. Emotions, in fact, guide our behavior, but they do not determine it. Um, we can manage our emotions to feel better, to do better, or to be better, but we don't always have to. In fact, maybe sometimes we can just lie in the grass and smell the flowers. Um, and enjoy emotions as one toolbox among many. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maya. 
I just wanted to make sure that I understand the notion of aha moment. Are you, are you speaking about that I'm conscious to the, to the emotion? Because when I think about aha, I'm aware of the fact that I feel. But most of the time I do not. I cannot report to myself that I'm angry now. In retrospective, or if somebody else, you know, tell me that you are angry, but most of the time it's for me, not aha. I'm, 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 I'm functioning, I'm, I'm acting, but I'm not aware. So what do you mean by aha moment? Yes. <laughs> I do think that emotions are conscious experiences. And the reason I think that is because they involve um, many unconscious components. But in order to feel emotion, we have to label it, and therefore it involves subjective conscious experiences. Yes. Okay, thank you. Questions? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah, please. You learn. Okay, sorry. Uh, when I was younger, I studied some martial arts, and uh, one of the first things you learn through martial arts is not to be angry when you fight, and you fight much better. You have to be controlled. So, how does it fall? Or there was a time when I would give talks about. Um, the potential utility of anger, and I would open this talk with a quote of um, uh, a martial arts Olympian um, athlete who would always get angry before getting into fights, because for that person, anger was motivating. Um, in other contexts, anger may not necessarily be motivating. I think that the key of what I'm, the, the message that I'm trying to convey is anger neither one or the other. Anger is whatever you make it to be as a function of how you perceive it, what's right for you, and what's appropriate in the situation. Now, of course, oftentimes it feels like it's taking over, um, but for different people, it does very, very different things. So whether it's good or bad to feel angry when you fight kind of depends on who's asking and who's answering. Yes, please, Bill. Thank you for the lecture. Uh, how, do you, how will you refer to the theory of the three components of emotions, the physical, uh, intellectual, and, uh, a, 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 and the thought, uh, with regard to what you just said about uh, the, that emotions are uh, actually, we are aware of it. So what is the reference to this theory? What is the reference to the theory that emotions are comprised of, of three components? Well, so, okay, let me go back and say, there are many different theories of emotions out there. There are theories out there that are inconsistent with um, psychological constructionist approaches to emotion, which I shared with you today. According to psychological construction, there is affect, the body plays a huge role in emotion, um, as do a variety of other components that are typically included or referred to parts of emotions. The only difference is that according to the psychological construction approach, all these things are merely components. And what, what sticks them together is that conscious moment of labeling. When we use a concept to make sense of all these things that are sometimes happening together and sometimes aren't, Sometimes they're related and sometimes they're not. Um, it's incredibly empowering because when you realize that how you feel is partly a function of how you make meaning and what you know, and we're all here to cultivate knowledge, um, I think it's, it's, a, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very um, uh, empowering uh, model. But it doesn't um, rule out the fact that emotions exist. It doesn't um, rule out the fact that emotions involve physiological components and they involve cognitive aspect. It just ties them together in different ways and, and explains them differently. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maya. So, our next speaker is uh, Professor Talma Hendler. She's from Tel Aviv University, from the Sagol Center of Tel Aviv University, and Talma is working on the, actually she's a, she's a psychiatrist in her background, and she's trying to connect brain activity 
brain function to the emotional world. Calma. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, very, very special event. Uh, I've been studying emotions for more than 20 years. Used to think about it, uh, used to think about my topic as esoteric and uh, fighting to be part of the, the neuroscientific community, although I'm studying emotions. So it's really, really uh, exciting to be suddenly in the center of this uh, interest. And uh, I will um, try to tell you a little bit about uh, the brain and its relation to uh, and how it handles emotions or how it processes emotions. Um, I first want to thank a lot of my students mentioned on the left and some of my collaborators and the funding uh, uh, founding foundations. And a um, special thank to Sami and Tova for supporting me and uh, helping me to make my dream true, <laughs> so to say. So as a psychiatrist, like you heard, I am a cognitive scientist, neuroscientist and a psychiatrist. And that actually motivated my, uh, my research to try and close the therapeutic gap in psychiatry. And uh, this gap uh, can be um, represented by two people coming in the clinic and uh, complaining about completely different things and getting exactly the same diagnosis and prescribing, pres being prescribed the same therapy. Uh, I would summarize this situation as a problem of personalization and precision, or lack of personalization and lack of precision. And precision, uh, sorry, personalization is the, 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 our, stri our aim or goal in, in medicine to give unique therapy to each person. And it's the who issue. And the precision is about trying to uh, give treatment that is mechanism and process driven rather than only symptoms. And unfortunately, uh, in psychiatry, we are far from there. Uh, from my clinical experience as a psychiatrist, I've been convinced, I was first a psychiatrist and then uh, turned into a neuroscientist, uh, I have been convinced that emotions are the building blocks of our mental health. And in order to help people alleviate their mental suffering, we need to understand what is an emotion. And uh, I took the road to do it uh, through studying the brain and trying to understand what are the brain mechanisms that uh, underlie emotions and identify them. Uh, and importantly, to unveil the complexity of emotions by using multi-scale measurements. And what do I mean? It's important so you can follow my lecture later on. So I'm using many different techniques to measure the brain and they have different qualities, advantages and uh, limitations. Uh, so functional MRI on the bottom uh, is well known for being great anatomically, uh, um, anatomical measure but quite poor temporarily because our neurons fire in milliseconds and fMRI gives, gives us information in seconds. While EEG and intracranial recordings from uh, the brain give us this temporal um, information but not always can give us the full picture of the brain like fMRI. So the solution is to combine and use both and I hope I will be able to show you that. And lastly, I try to take some of the insights that come out from my work in the lab and implement it in the real world. I think without that, we are wasting our time. And that's an effort by itself, and we should be all aware of it. Uh, OK, so starting from personalization, the problem here is that uh, emotional expressions 
are diverse and subjective. And when a person comes to the clinic and being assessed as depressed by telling us a lot of things, is this, this person or these people actually uh, tell us very different things that I very schematically, I don't, I don't think you can see it, very schematically I presented it as two clouds or two clusters. On the left, the red cluster, is um, uh, the expressions of affect, what I call affect, and it's basic universal feelings uh, of, uh, of emotions that often include physical feelings like tiredness and uh, pain. On the right side, there is the blue cloud that I call concept. And this actually alludes very nicely to Maya, and thank you for giving me this introduction. Uh, so it's the concept where people express their more cognitive aspect of their emotions. And we would hear things like no hope and unloved, and this is often related to our self-percept and also relations to other. So, when someone says, I'm depressed, this could be all of this. And in fact, we think the integration of these different feelings makes the emotional experience. Uh, and when we come to the brain and precision, here we have another problem where the brain is actually requires to process often what seems conflicting processes in terms of timing and, uh, and um, resolution. And on one hand, the affect uh, is uh, considered as an automatic and rapidly pro rapid process uh, related to reactivity and maybe to tagging safety or danger. And it's uh, assigning unique balance of value to things in the world. On the other hand, the concept is considered as a related to elaborative, relatively slower process that also relates to reflection, self-reflection, reflections on others, and it's based on memories and prior experience, and again, the self and others. So, uh, just, uh, this is to my title, to allude to my title, uh, and in the brain, very, very schematically, we, make, we must make things a little simple to make them then more complex. We can think about it as related to, to these processes, as related to two systems in the brain. The prefrontal cortex related more to the concept uh, processes, while the limbic system, what was considered the, uh, traditionally the emotional brain, is related to the affect. Uh, of course, they are not working there separately, and in fact, in order to experience emotions, they must integrate and co-operate. Co and I will try to show it. So, emotional experience is the integration of these two processes, at least two processes. And then comes Barrett and Mosquita, like also Maya mentioned, and they a little bit shattered the, the boat by saying, listen, this is, emotions are not static, there's really this dynamics, and it, in fact, these are emerging phenomena that uh, very much like thinking, and here comes also the aha maybe, the aha moments. There are things coming and going all the time and interacting, and in fact, these processes are recursive and not separate, and the emotional experience is the moments where they meet and, and, and they modified. And more so, they claim, like also you heard, that emotions are there in order to help us behave adaptively. And our behavior, in fact, also change these processes. So there is this complexity of interaction between at least three processes that makes us feel emotions. So, how can we take this to the lab and ask, uh, is it true, is these models have any validity in the, in, in the brain? So, first, um, I would like to describe this uh, study uh, that aimed to uncover the synergy between process of concept and process of affect. And in order to do that, because most of the time these things are mixed, we use two modalities music on one hand, which is abstractive, abstractive relatively, uh, and, and uh, brings up the affect, while a narrative coming from short videos that are very concrete in their story and uh, neutral in their affect. And uh, we looked what happened in the brain when we 
either see the movies alone, on the music alone, or when they are combined. And by having two roots of these two processes, we were able to actually uh, look at the synergy. And uh, just to demo the situation that a person uh, sees and feels in the scanner, so this is the neutral movie, you see a car going in the, in the road, and uh, and this is when we put music to it. So you feel very happy immediately. So the same movie, but very different aspect to it. And then... So this is a very small manipulation that allow us to look at the combination. So when we look at the fMRI, this is an fMRI experiment, on the left you see visual only, on the right you see auditory. Uh, here, even because the music was very short, we don't even see the limbic system, although it's the affect. Uh, and when we see the, com when people experience the combined information, we, that's where we see the, uh, the limbic system represented here by the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex represented by the lateral prefrontal cortex. And we think this is where the synergy happens. But because this is fMRI, as I told you, resolution in time is very poor and we cannot really still separate them apart. For that, we uh, used intracranial recordings. Uh, depth recordings and also subdural recordings uh, taken from the amygdala or the temporal lobe and from the prefrontal cortex in epilepsy patients, in patients with epilepsy who undergo assessment before surgery. So this is invasive, but in people that need this invasive uh, uh, procedure. And what we found here, very, very briefly, I tell you, is that the, the recordings from the limbic system, the areas in the limbic systems, in the combined condition, not in the movie alone, and not in the uh, music alone, uh, was very phasic and fast and high frequency. While the information, record, the, the recordings from the prefrontal cortex was actually reduced to the stimuli and was sustained throughout the video uh, uh, information. So this kind of suggests that maybe the limbic system is indeed the system that is processing rapidly uh, affective tagging while the prefrontal cortex is coming in and providing the context and helping us to recursively interact with more information that comes from the world. So this is just uh, one one example of how we study these very complex questions of uh, emotional processes and um, kind of support the idea that the prefrontal cortex and the limbic areas are indeed essential and they have different roles. Uh, another experiment that I want to share with you is going more deeper into dynamics uh, not at the level of the neurons, but rather at the level of our experience, which is a little slower. And that's where we can use fMRI together with cinematic clips that now they are long. They are seven, eight minutes long. And we can already experience the story and the peaks of the emotions. And specifically, we study said movie. One of the studies we used said movie, Stepmom. Uh, in which a mother, a dying mother, sep is separating from, their ch from her children. And it's a very, very uh, sad moment of uh, separation and uh, intimacy between the mother and the children. So people were actually passively viewing the movies while they were in the scanner. And when they came out, they reported how sad they are. They were. So we had the, their subjective experience of sadness as well as the whole brain. And here we looked at the whole brain. And uh, you have here in colors these three systems, three systems related to the three processes that I mentioned. The affect, the concept, and the action or the behavior. And uh, I'll show you how the brain is dynamically changing while people viewing these movies by connecting the dots. That means that these regions are actually co-modulated together or be within the networks or between the networks. So a short movie again. You can view it and listen to... I still have one thing, one of our greatest things we're going to always have. You know what that is? So you can see 
you don't see so well, but um, the mother is talking to the child and telling him that he's go she's going to the sky and she will be a butterfly. Summer and in the winter and in the rain and the sun. And you can see how each network is connected within itself, but also a little bit with other networks, so there is an integration. And on the top you see the subjective rating that people are already sentenced. But when they hug, there is this full integration of the whole, uh, uh, all these areas that we are measuring from. And hugging is indeed a very um, embodied uh, moment of your emotions. And uh, we strongly simulate with it. And uh, so I think this reflects better uh, about the idea of uh, a constructivist uh, theory in which uh, concept and affect come together to uh, create, the, to emerge, to, to form the emotional experience, but also lead to the behavior. But until now, I only showed you work where we measure perception and not behavior. In order to measure behavior, we must go to gaming. So in emotional experience, we have all these nice things because we have to evoke emotions. So here we created a, a paradigm uh, calling uh, Primo. Uh, in order to uncover behavioral choices that uh, come in the context of incentives, of motivations, of good and bad things that happens to us in the world. Uh, in, in, uh, in fact, uh, a person needs to move the discard man and try to catch uh, shekels and avoid balls. So on the way to the shekels, he has to take a risk and to avoid balls. And just to show you how active it is <laughs> while you are in the scanner, or while we are measuring your recordings from the brain. So this I will show you both uh, levels. So this is very active. And once in a while he would <coughs> caught a shekel and other times he will be hit with a ball. So we have rewards and we have punishment. And uh, I'm only showing you here the results from the intracranial recording. So we recorded from the prefrontal cortex and from the limbic system, amygdala and uh, hippocampus. The, the circles that you see are the neurons or bunch of uh, groups of neurons that are colored according to their sensitivity, either to the punishment, the reddish colors, or to the rewards, the more green, bluish colors. So even without being neuroscientists, you can tell that uh, the prefrontal cortex is more sensitive to punishment. Uh, more neurons in the prefrontal cortex were more activated when people were punished rather than when they were rewarded. On the other hand, in the limbic system, in the amygdala and the hippocampus, we see mixture. But uh, the other thing, this is one finding. The other finding is that prefrontal cortex respond to punishment a little bit before the limbic system, actually. And the last finding is the most interesting, I think, is that the limbic system actually when it responds to, respond to punishment, it affects the next choice, a behavioral choice that people make towards avoidance. So it seems that the limbic system is actually most influential of the behavior, but it gets the information from the prefrontal cortex. So here we, all the way to the behavior in humans and looking at the brains. So I think, I hope I convince you by now that uh, we can, parcel out and try to study this very complex phenomena even in the brain and that um, prefrontal cortex is important but it seems that the limbic system is really crucial to our uh, well-being and uh, the last part I will try in my in the, the last uh, minutes to show you how we take such an insight all the way to the clinic and uh, here um, I will focus on the amygdala uh, because there is accumulating evidence that the amygdala specifically is involved in psychopathology. Uh, in our studies we showed, and then it was also shown by others, that hyperactive amygdala could be a, a vulnerability marker for stress reaction, pathological stress reaction after exposure. And uh, others show that amygdala is involved in anxiety, in phobia, and in PTSD, hyperactive amygdala. So it seems that at least if we could uh, uh, harness the amygdala 
to the clinical uh, practice, we could help people uh, improve their uh, psychiatric condition. And the approach I would like to present to you here, I think, give us the, uh, a promising uh, path to harness the brain for our well, mental, health, uh, uh, mental health. And this is brain-computer interface approach, also known as neurofeedback. You heard a little bit about similar things yesterday, the people who were in the, in the dinner. Uh, but here, it's about connecting between our mental state and our brain state. And this is being done by contingent feedback when they are actually associated. So people apply a certain mental strategy and the aim for them is to change something in the brain. When these two are uh, aligned, people get feedback and they get positive feedback. So it becomes reinforcement learning for volitional neuromodulation. So non-invasively, people actually learn to control the brain. And of course, I don't have time to show you all the evidence, but uh, there is a lot of work showing that this is possible, actually also in animals, not only in humans. So it's not all conscious. It could be also done implicitly. Uh, and I will only try to show you how we go about doing it for the amygdala. So I already told you that the best way to measure the amygdala is the fMRI anatomically. But if we want to measure, if we want to now provide treatment to many people and in an affordable manner to be scalable, we cannot really use the fMRI and take it home and take it and bring everyone to the fMRI. And for that, we need to move to other measurements that are more scalable, like the electrical encephalogram, the EEG. And uh, the problem is that the EEG doesn't read well from deep brain areas. So the signals that we get are not precise anatomically. And we want to be precise. We want the amygdala. And to deal with this, we combined information from fMRI and EEG and computationally uh, develop models that represent information from the fMRI in the EEG ended up in what we call electrical fingerprint, a model of the EEG. And with this, we can do the neurofeedback now that target the amygdala. Of course, I have to prove, I have, I had to prove it before I can say that and I don't have time to show you, but this is possible. And we already showed that when people trained uh, to downregulate their electrical fingerprint, we can uh, improve their stress resilience, we can reduce their PTSD symptoms, we can reduce pain symptoms, and we can alleviate depression. So there is uh, a lot to do here yet, uh, but we are on our way, I hope. Uh, and this we call process-based neurofeedback because we are neuroanatomically specific and also using interface that is context specific and psychiatry is about context so it's really important the way we feedback and i will uh, end with this uh, with this video that is actually a neurofeedback based on amygdala eeg we call it waiting room scenarios people view this uh, scenario which is virtual uh, in 3d and hear the sounds and the sounds are negative so the uh, the aim of the person that is trained is to lower the sound and sit the people. And uh, when this is successful, you can see the signal going down. Uh, people are sitting down and the sound is being reduced. So this is the feedback for the person that is actually on his way or her way to uh, associate mental state with a, a mental with a brain state in this case down regulating and we can also teach people to up regulate and then the people will stand up and the sound will be much uh, more uh, intense so to summarize all of this uh, i hope we are on our way to have a future psychiatric clinic in which we don't only think symptoms and signs we think brain and we not only think brain fMRI, we also think brain with measurements that are scalable and we can take them home and we can measure more and more of them and learn more and more of the brain. And we can interact when we consider the disorder as a set of emotional processes that uh, can be 
guided or can be uh, related to different types of treatment. I only showed you one treatment, but I actually think we should use all of the treatments that we have in an in a, uh, intelligent way or in a process-oriented way, psychotherapy, drug therapy, as well as neurofeedback. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, one quick question. There are also tools to stimulate the brain, like TMS or deep TMS. So you can put on your brain this uh, and, and target specific regions, you know, uh, automatically. And there are people that are using. Can you say a word about this intervention? Uh, I want to uh, differentiate between them. The TMS or transcranial magnetic stimulation is, or, or, or there are also other things like TDCS. And of course, there are the invasive things also. Uh, they are uh, actually coming from outside, trying to change the brain. Uh, here, I am suggesting something that actually connects your internal uh, stream of information of emotion with your brain and gives you the control to change your brain. So I think these are very different approaches. And uh, they could be complementary, actually. And uh, I don't think the precision is so good in TMS and TDCS, but you could improve them. You could improve the precision if you combine them with cognitive tasks that are specific. So the idea, like we are using it, if you activate a certain system in the brain, and then you can modulate it more specific. So people do it in TMS and as well as in neurofeedback. Questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, our last speaker for this morning session uh, before the break will be in Balben Ami. In Balben Ami is also from Tel Aviv University, like Talma, uh, from the psychology department, isn't he? Department of Psychology, also from the Sakol Center, and and, uh, and in Bal will talk about uh, helping others in distress. Thank you very much. Hi. Good morning. It really is an enormous, enormous honor and pleasure to be here and uh, great talks this morning. Really wonderful to follow that up. <laughs> I'm in Bal Benami Bartal. I'm a researcher at Sagol uh, School of Neuroscience at Tel Aviv University. So Sami and Tova, you really actually are supporting you know, me personally and a lot, of other, uh, a lot of other scientists in Israel and your support to science is really remarkable and has enabled so many of us to do things that we, weren't, we wouldn't be, be able to do otherwise. So thank you very much. And I'm really interested in understanding uh, why we help other people, and particularly people in distress. And I'm going to talk today about the neural networks that are involved in this type of behavior. And uh, I'm going to uh, take a rather <laughs> different approach uh, than the rest of the talks, because uh, I uh, do a more molecular type of research that's focused on understanding what happens in the brain in terms of which, which cells are involved in these types of behaviors and which neuromodulators are involved. And for that, we actually use a rodent model. We do our research with rats in my lab. But the questions that we're interested in exploring are focused on really what happens in your brain from the moment that you see somebody in distress to that moment where you decide to approach and help that individual. And uh, this is really uh, quite an important question, and uh, especially 
because our, our tendency to decide to go and help somebody else is really influenced by the identity of that individual. And uh, deciding why we care so much about the pain and distress of one individual, but we're not at all moved by a different individual because of things like their group identity or things that determine uh, who they are, is really, I think, the most important question of our time today. And the reason that we, we really need to figure out uh, different strategies to approach this type of problem because you know all of the enormous resources that have gone into advancing helping and empathy and prosociality in our culture you know have, have been moderately successful at best and we need to find new strategies because the challenges that we are facing as a species are not the type of challenges that we will be able to face it with this growing polarization that we've been seeing in our culture. You know, I can speculate about why that's been happening and what, you know, the, the role of social media in that and things like that. But, you know, if you ask why do I study this question in a rodent model and not in humans, is because I really believe that this type of research provides us a very unique perspective into uh, the, the, the basic drivers of our behavior, that we can strip away some of this complexity that maybe confuses us when we are, uh, when we're looking at, you know, our, our really complex human minds. So in advance, I'd like to, you know, apologize if some of the views that I take are a little bit reductionist today when we're thinking about something like emotions. Uh, but, you know, I want to take you back a little bit, uh, back evolutionarily, and think about the biological basis of this type of behavior. And what you're seeing here in this picture is an award-winning uh, photo, is a marmot that's been uh, found by a fox. And actually, uh, in, you know, in the next few minutes, this marmot would actually be uh, lose its life to the fox, unfortunately. Uh, but, you know, it's really striking uh, to see the facial expression of this marmot. And I think we can all, you know, identify with what must be going on uh, for that animal in that moment. And, you know, the, the very basic role of emotions for us is, as, you know, as my colleagues have already mentioned, is to try to, uh, to determine, to organize our behavior, whether we should approach something or avoid a certain stimulus. And, you know, as, as uh, organisms have become more and more complex, uh, this need to, to be able to make that decision very quickly uh, without prior uh, you know, experience in that specific moment, like I don't need to stick my finger into the socket every time. I remember that last time I did it, it hurt or I saw somebody else do it and, you know, something terrible happened to them. So that determines my behavior. That's a really important role for emotions. But emotions have another role that we haven't really focused on in the earlier talks today, and that's a social role because emotions uh, are, you know, not only uh, organizing our behavior, they also uh, are a very important part of uh, communicating with others. And actually, almost more than 80% of the species on Earth, I think that's the research, are social species. And what social means is you send signals for others to be received by others and that influence the action of other organisms in your environment and that's actually not only true for animals that's also true for some plants so you know so this really important role in survival and reproduction is communicating the internal state to other individuals and influence the way that they will respond and this you know we can study this with rodents because they are actually remarkably similar to us in many ways in the evolutionary uh, uh, con evolutionarily conserved neural structures and autonomic system, endocrine activity that support all these very basic social behaviors from nurturing to, uh, to, to managing life in a social environment. 
And I, in my lab, focus on empathy and the way that influences our, you know, our drive to help somebody in distress. But I don't really think of empathy as an emotion, so I can get away <laughs> maybe with uh, studying it with, uh, in rats. Because what I think about empathy, I think about a mechanism for transferring an affective state or an emotional state between individuals. And what you're seeing here sums up a couple of decades of, of research in human subjects. Uh, and, you know, when we see somebody uh, experiencing pain or distress, we have a very, very typical response that you can see in this facial expression, right? A, an aversive emotional response to somebody else's pain or distress. And it's been uh, demonstrated that this vicarious negative aversal arousal to somebody else's pain or distress is uh, based on activity in this neural network that we think of as processing the affective or emotional components of, of pain or distress. And so this neural network that's actually quite dispersed in the brain uh, and doesn't require complex cognitive uh, uh, mechanisms per se, but involves regions from the brain same stem to areas uh, involving uh, limbic active emotional processing, um, the anterior insula and the anterior cingulate cortex in particular are two areas that are involved in this awareness of, of an aversive response. Even when you see something disgusting, for instance, the system is activated. And we know that not only are the same regions active for your own distress and another person's distress that you observe, it's actually the very same neurons that we see active in regions like the anterior cingulate cortex. So we tend to think of this as a neural basis for empathic uh, responding or resonance. And, you know, in, in the field of psychology, we often uh, postulate that this empathic response to other people's pain is a really important driver for prosocial behavior, like helping. Okay, and, and this, this really intuitive idea has been widely researched by important uh, investigators that have shown a, a, a correlation between how much people report they feel empathy and how, how much are they willing to help or to, to, to give, uh, to provide support or uh, uh, any kind of help to somebody else. And so, you know, it is true that uh, helping others and working for others is a really important part of our life in social groups, and we see it in ways that are big and small in our everyday life, but especially we respond to others in distress. And uh, this connection between this distress response and how we respond to it actually probably happens in a different neural system. It's not this aversive negative arousal that we see, rather it's activity in this motivational network, what we call the reward network, a network that involves this uh, drive to approach or to, to, to act, to seek something that is, uh, that is desired by us. So this system that we see activated is another is a system that we activate in other situations for example if we uh, eat something delicious or we win money and in human studies it's been shown that this system is activated when people donate money or social resources so this so-called so you know inherent glow of of helping or or um acting in a positive pro-social way uh, is a very interesting part of this behavior. And actually, a, sort of an emerging scientific field uh, is trying to investigate the, the mechanism by which doing things for others or working for the greater good actually improves the well-being of the helpers. This is something, you know, that's well anchored in ancient uh, uh, philosophical thought or Buddhist, you know, ideas. But now we're, we're actually trying to look also at the molecular mechanisms that explain why doing for others improves our own well-being and our own immune resilience and things like that. 
So in my work, I've focused on rodents, uh, uh, particularly rats, uh, based on a pretty solid body of evidence across different labs across the world, demonstrating that rats and mice have basic empathic capacities. They are influenced by the pain and distress of others. They are emotionally contagious by other animals' distress and even itch or pain. And so um, rats are a really social animal. They even, uh, you know, they have very social behaviors like uh, uh, growing their pups together in the wild or they have very complex social hierarchies. So in that sense, you know, they're not very dissimilar to us. And so in our lab, we use this a paradigm that looks at a very simple test. Will a rat be motivated by the distress of another in, uh, individual to help that, uh, that animal? And in this situation, one animal is trapped in this little jail. It's, like, it's called a restrainer, which has a door that can be opened from the outside. And the rat on the outside can open the door and release the trapped rat on the inside. And what we see is that after a few days of experiencing this paradigm for one hour every day, the rats just learn without any previous reward or training. They learn how to open this door, which is not an easy feat, and they release the rat inside. And they do this uh, even when they don't have a chance to interact with the animal on the inside. You can see here a very pink rat and a very blue rat. Those are just colors uh, that are, we use for the video tracking. And in this situation, you can see this, uh, this female rat learning to open the door from the side, which is pretty heavy and hard for her to push down. And rats will continue to do this behavior even when they don't get to play with the other rat, they will continue to do this every day for months at a time. And they are doing it specifically to alleviate the distress of the trapped rat. We know this because we can block helping behavior by blocking the transfer of the stress with basic pharmacological interventions. So, you know, rats like us uh, are not just kind to any rat like us, they have an, uh, an empathy bias for outgroup members. Uh, you know, humans, you know, we, we are very biased to helping our own group members. Uh, there are many studies showing parochial altruism plays a major role in our society and I think we all are familiar with this from our daily lives and, you know, that's a topic for a whole course of study so I'm not going to elaborate too much of that. Uh, but I will tell you that rats also respond to their in-group members. So while rats help cage mates that they're familiar with and strangers from their own strain, they do not at all help strangers from an unfamiliar strain. In this picture, you can see the strangers from the other strain have this black cape fur on their backs and they look very different and they don't get helped at all. So this uh, disparity uh, allows for, uh, for us to test what do the brains of these rats look like in situations where they're feeling pro-social motivation uh, as opposed to situations where they're not interested at all in helping the other rats. I will though, I want to say something encouraging <laughs> with a message of world peace is that Rat, this is totally flexible. So if rats are, are co-housed together for two weeks, that's enough not only to get them to totally shift their pro-social motivation and help that cage mate from the other strain, but then they also help strangers from the outgroup. After they have two weeks of co-housing, I wish we were that nice. So uh, to, to ask what happens biologically, and we're, we're interested in a very holistic, systemic sort of view. So we want to know what happens, which brain regions are active. We also want to know which hormones are released, what happens in the body of these animals, what's, you know, what do they find exciting, to help us to ask all these uh, questions about, about the motivational state of these animals. And we combine cutting-edge 
uh, neuroscience methods to recreate a sort of fMRI kind of uh, approach in humans and uh, conduct a brain-wide mapping of the neural activity in these rats. We do that using fluorescent markers to tag neurons that were active while rats were performing this task. And we can also trace those neurons that were active and ask where do they come from and which subsets of populations are involved specifically in the decision to approach and help. And we can also measure activity using calcium indicators we can measure activity while these rats are moving around and performing this task to really see uh, minute, you, instant by instant, what is happening in their brains as they're approaching the trapped rats. And uh, trying to sum up a big body of research here in a couple of slides, I will just tell you the bottom line. The bottom line is that what we see is that these rats that are with a trapped rat activate the same network that we consider the empathy network in humans who respond to others in pain or distress. The very same regions, the anterior insula, the anterior cingulate cortex, areas in the prefrontal cortex that are active, and also other areas related to social memory and uh, aversive processing. But the interesting thing is that this empathic activity doesn't at all predict whether those rats will help the trapped rat or not. We see this activity also with rats with the outgroup members. So the way that we interpret this is to say this network, this aversive response network, is used to process the fact that the other rat is in distress. But what does predict whether somebody will help or not? It's activity in the reward network that you can see active here in red. So the reward network that is the very same network that we see in humans donating money or social resources that I mentioned before, we also see solely and uniquely in these rats who are helping the trapped rats. And so what we're trying to figure out is how this empathy network and this motivational reward network combined together to provide this helping behavior. And, uh, you know, the other aspect that I mentioned is how exactly the identity or this categorization of social identity happen in the brain to influence the whole cascade of emotional and motivational responses. I think that's a really important question that is really not uh, well understood today. But it is becoming more well understood and what I want to suggest is that basically your whole brain participates in this type of response. And areas of social memory are used to identify um, the, the group membership of this rat. We have evidence for that from newer studies that are not yet published. CA2 in the hippocampus participates in that. And uh, areas in sensory cortex that are used to respond to the, to the distress calls, for instance, uh, act in a completely different way when you value the outcome for the, per the individual in need. Um, so uh, so the, the way that your brain uh, tunes attention to the distress calls of someone and how much you're willing to act for their benefit is influenced by how much you value the outcome of that individual far more than how much you think they are suffering. For instance, you know, if my daughter cuts her finger, I, I will be willing to you run over to another building and find the band-aid for her, even though, you know, it's just a little cut. But somebody else who I don't know or from another group membership can be suffering much more and I will pass by them on the street and not even notice their, their pain or suffering. And that's basically the summary slides are trying to present that idea so that going away, shifting away, based on all these findings from field work with, with animal models, we're shifting our view that empathy is uh, the, the, ma the main driver for pro-social behavior, because then we would predict that the more you mirror the suffering of the other, the more you will be motivated to help them. To view where we think of this 
mirroring or shared distress as one type of uh, one type of uh, process that happens uh, in the brain, and this pro-social drive to approach and help, an innate biologically based pro-social drive, is another type of process, and it is based on the identity of the person in need. And the way to prime helping behavior is to prime the value of the outcome for that other individual. And I would like to thank my amazing lab at Tel Aviv University. Who we work on a diverse uh, array of projects. We look at the development of uh, pro-social behavior. We look at the influence of trauma during early life on uh, adult behavior and try to understand the molecular mechanisms that drive this long-term shift in, uh, in adult animals who had experienced early life stress, and we look at well-being and trying to understand how the social context or receiving social support or, in contrast, social isolation, which is unfortunately an epidemic of our time, uh, influence our capacity to withstand a challenge to our immune system, and, uh, and uh, we, we have a very big computational uh, aspect to our research as well that I didn't go into today. Uh, but all of these different uh, approaches to really try to understand and develop new strategies for increasing prosociality. Thank you. And one last comment I would like to say, if I may, uh, is that you know we we stand in front of you uh, as uh, aspiring you know, transformative scientist. And by the way, it doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman, this is true for both. It's actually a team of people who is standing here. And not, you know, the, 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 the people who, uh, who supported me along the way, not only my mentors scientifically, uh, my family, my husband who was always willing to, you know, follow me or across the world you know, from Israel to Europe, Chicago, Berkeley, back here, you know, and, and, uh, and uh, of course the team of students who are working on all of these projects. And I would like to suggest that we shift away from admiring a, a, an individual who is standing here uh, to lauding uh, the idea that uh, Viviana mentioned, the ideas come easy, but to accomplish them, and to turn them into reality, it takes a team, and that whole team is standing in front of you now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Questions before the break? Yes, please, Viviana. Thank you, very inspiring. I want to ask you about mirror neurons and Rizzolatti, you know, the Italian scientist whose team discovered mirror neurons. You didn't mention them. Is it overcome? Are they still important? Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I like to think of mirror neurons as the way that our brain, uh, we've noticed something about the way that our brain uh, processes meaning of a stimulus. So if I, um, if, I, if the same neuron is active when I see the word square and when I see an image of a square, uh, that actually means that that neuron participates in processing the, the construct of a square. And so I think that there definitely is a very basic neural principle that, uh, that we can think about as a, you know, as a mirror kind of principle. Uh, I kind of shy away from the idea that has become a little too much where people say there are special neurons that are empathy neurons, okay? And that's a little bit been kind of, uh, for a while that was the, the, the type of conversation that was being heard in, in my field. And so that's why I kind of on purpose try to skirt that issue. Thank you. Yes, please, there. One second. Oh, where are you? Oh, okay. 
I, I just want to know if you saw a difference in the result uh, from the gender of the rats and the age of the rats. Uh, yeah, we have uh, two, two papers that are now uh, in the factory. One is about adolescent rats compared to, to adults, and one is uh, gender differences. And uh, yeah, you know, maybe not super surprising. Females are a little bit better at this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, that being said, actually part of the impetus for starting my whole line of research with male rats was, you know, to, to try to, 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 to work with, you know, with, uh, uh, to try to show that this is a more general phenomenon that's not related to maternal care, per se, and that's exactly what we see. And, you know, the ambassador has mentioned a really important word, friendship. You know, so we're not really allowed to talk about friendship in animals, but when we're, we are talking about uh, prosociality between same-sex conspecifics that are not related to one another, and uh, they definitely don't react in a random way towards other individuals, there's, there are studies actually looking at that. So, you know, I do think that there is some kind of uh, uh, what you would call a rat form of uh, maybe friendship. Yeah, um, here. What about the immune system? So you, t you said that you looked at the immune system. Did you see any changes in the immune cells? That, uh, th we're working on that right now, so it's a little bit top secret. Okay. Another one, last one, up there, up there, up there, up there. Hello. So first of all, thank you for the lecture. It was very interesting. And I wanted to ask, uh, there is a researcher, I think her name is uh, Sherry Turkel from MIT, and she says she's a psychologist, and uh, she said that there is a reduction in empathy in our time. And it's a question not about rats, but about uh, humans. Uh, in relation to screen, uh, how do you say, uh, social networks, screen meetings, uh, and uh, I wanted to ask if something that you can say something about. Um, you know, the views are mixed on that one. Uh, some people think we're living in an age of reduced empathy, and others say that we're living in the most empathic age ever compared to human history. So I, I don't know what I think about that, but uh, I definitely, I think that uh, we should focus or shift the discussion towards uh, tribalism and uh, the, the echo chambers that we've been seeing, because I, I think that the, you know, the, the, the the very same person can be incredibly empathic and pro-social towards their in-group and at the same breath turn around and be very anti-social towards a, an out-group member. And, you know, so I think our current, the social media is, is amplifying uh, this, this fact that we've been seeing, even to the point where people, they're, they're so tribal that they're even willing to hurt their own health in order to stay within the, the, the tribally determined uh, uh, identity. So I, I, I think that is the dangerous slope that we're experiencing. And the way to approach it, I think, is to talk about how we break through those identities. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so we are going to have a break now, uh, now until 12, but I just want to tell you, or maybe you would like to look at it, there is a recent paper that I prepared myself for this meeting, came from, the Berkeley, from Berkeley University about trying to count how many emotions do we have. It's the 27 emotions paper. I don't know what the researchers in this field, but I'm just going to read a few and then we'll... So we have 27 emotions, that's the consensus at least from Berkeley. Admiration, adoration, aesthetic appreciation, this is alphabetical. Adoration, admiration, aesthetic appreciation, amusement, anxiety, awe, bo boredom, calmness, confusion, craving. 
di di disgust. So let's stop with craving and go for the coffee. Thank you very much. <laughs> See you in 12, at 12 o'clock back. Thank you. Please sit down. So I would like to invite Daniel Hoffman for the next piece, emotional piece. Daniel, please. Daniel. I would like to invite uh, Professor Muna Maroon from Haifa University, also part of the Sagol Center there. Muna, thank for coming. Sorry for the wound in the, in the leg. Slowly, slowly. <laughs> Muna will speak about how to reduce fear by social support. Muna. Thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon. Hi. Thank you, Aidan. Viviana, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, this uh, invitation. I'm very delighted uh, to be here. And uh, thanks uh, to all these uh, wonderful women uh, that spoke and presented the, their talk. And I would like, uh, uh, you will see during my talk that I also work on, uh, on female animals, female rats. It's not that only finding uh, 50 great uh, women 
it was a hard mission. There are plenty of, uh, uh, of wonderful women, but even studying mechanisms of learning and memory in female rats, for example, is really missing. And we are focusing mainly on, uh, on males, and I will present this data that we start to accumulate. So as uh, Dan said, I'm going to talk about fear. Fear is very simple in, in, in terms of uh, emotion, but it is very, very necessary for our survival. Ah, this is not, uh, this is not uh, the right presentation uh, uh, later on, but uh, it's okay, I will manage. So if I will ask, uh, where have you been uh, on the 24th of, uh, of October last year? I think no one will remember. Sami, do you remember where have you been on 24th of October last year? Okay, so however, if I will ask, where have you been on, on September the 11th, uh, when it happens, uh, 2001, I think uh, no one will ever say that I forgot where I have been because this was a very intense emotional, uh, emotional experience. So we all remember because it, uh, there is one structure that is implicated or a, 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 an emotion that is uh, developed, which is fear, which is a very vital response to physical and emotional danger and is crucial for our, for our survival. So always I ask my students not to think in terms of, uh, of humans, but to, to think in terms of animals. And uh, imagine that animals do not feel fear. So the chances for survival and to protect themselves, it's, uh, it's becoming, it's becoming uh, 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 low. So when fear becomes pathological, this is what we are studying in the lab. So in the lab, we study uh, uh, fear conditioning and the extinction. And in order to better understand uh, um, the mechanisms of fear conditioning or fear formation, we need animal models or preclinical studies. So in the lab, we use the fear conditioning paradigm in which we associate or we pair between a conditioned stimulus, which is a, new, a neutral stimulus like a tone or context, together with electrical shock. So after pairing of these two stimulus for even one time, so there is a formation of long-term fear memory, which is expressed in an increased freezing to future presentation of this, of this uh, 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 stimulus, the tone or the context. Now, now, this fear memory can last for a lifetime, even in the life of animal. We can come and examine uh, 30 days later on, and we can see that there is still a freezing to the presentation of the context or the tone, and this is, this is the long-term fear memory. So, as I said, uh, fear memory is robust and uh, long-lasting and can last for a lifetime. Now, the nearest circuit which mediates uh, fear uh, memory is mainly composed of this tiny structure that is called the amygdala. And the amygdala is very important for the survival and for the execution of the emotional or physiological responses that are associated with, uh, with fear, like freezing, like increase in blood pressure, increase in hormones. And it also modulates uh, 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 the emotional type of, uh, of memories. As I said, uh, uh, fear responses can really last for a lifetime. However, fear is not something that is very uh, economical for, for the body and it's not uh, adaptive. So the animal needs to adapt when the situation does not predict any longer any danger. So we are now talking about extinction of fear conditioning, which relates to the idea that when we present after conditioning, when, when we present the animal again and again, again and again with this, uh, with this uh, stimulus without the appearance of the electrical shock, then uh, fear responses were gradually decreased and thus we will have a decrease in freezing and this is extinction of fear conditioning. Now, while fear association, as I said, can be formed even in one trial, one trial of association between context and electrical shock, can, uh, uh, can cause uh, fear memory that can last for months. Extinction memory, on the other hand, is formed after several trials and it's not permanent because fear can always be, be relapsed. Now, when we are talking about post-traumatic stress disorder, we are, then we are, work, we are talking about symptoms that is characterized by pathological acquisition, expression, and persistence of le learned fear association 
or in other words, more fear and impairment in fear extinction. Now, the neural circuit, as I said, that mediates uh, fear memory is the amygdala, which is very primitive uh, and it did not evolve uh, uh, across uh, evolution. And when we want to reduce the fear responses, then we are talking about the prefrontal cortex that was mentioned by, by Talma. And there are close anatomical connections between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex, suggesting that they interact and they can modulate each other. Now, the prefrontal cortex is very important, as, uh, as, as we know, in executive functions, in empathy, in feeling the others, in social memory. However, it, it has a very significant role also in extinction of fear conditioning. Now, within the prefrontal cortex, there were, uh, there were detected uh, subregions that they are very important for extinction memory. And here we, you, can, you can see that there is the, there is the infralimbic cortex, which, is, which encodes the memory of extinction of fear conditioning, meaning that if this, uh, if this uh, uh, structure is uh, impaired, then we can extinguish, we can reduce our fear, or the animal can reduce the fear responses on, on, on extinction training. However, on the next day, we need to repeat this over and over. Now, how the infralimbic cortex or how the prefrontal cortex affects the amygdala in order to, 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 have, uh, uh, to have extinction, so many hypotheses were uh, reported. This was, not, this was not supposed to be in my new presentation, but, uh, but I have it here, so I have to explain it. So there are connections between either the infralimbic cortex inhibiting a structure that does not excite the, amyg the central amygdala, which is the executive center of fear output, or alternatively, it, uh, it activates GABAergic or inhibitory interneurons, and these inhibitory interneurons inhibit the center of, uh, of fear uh, responses. However, regardless of which of these hypotheses is the correct one and how the, the prefrontal cortex inhibit the, the amygdala, we can, a very simple hypothesis could be delineated that during fear-provoking uh, situations, the amygdala, it's a very simplistic model, but during fear-provoking situations, the amygdala takes control in order to assure defensive behaviors and thus survival. However, as the situation changes and, and there is no danger, then the prefrontal cortex becomes dominant, and the emotional response that is elicited by the amygdala will be suppressed, inhibited, or in other words, in, extinguished. So the suppression of fear then will be impaired in cases in which the dominance will switch from the prefrontal cortex back to the amygdala. And this is indeed the post-traumatic stress disorder. And if I remember the first interview that I read about uh, Sami, and from that I know him, that, uh, that you were fascinated by, by these monks that they do meditation. You remember Sami? They do meditation and they found that these monks, they have more activation in face of emotional stimulus, they have more activation of the prefrontal cortex and less activation of the amygdala and thus they, they are not anxious all the time. So if we talk about then fear and uh, extinction, then we talk about, about uh, dominance between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. When we are frightened, then the amygdala is more dominant. And when we are, we are, uh, we are not frightened anymore, then the uh, prefrontal cortex is dominant. Now, can we play with this, uh, with this dominance and make the prefrontal cortex more dominant or the amygdala more dominant? And of course, and as uh, Talma said, there are, uh, there are maybe, uh, um, Talma mentioned uh, transmagnetic uh, stimulus, uh, TD TDCS. So they can, they can stimulate maybe the prefrontal cortex in order to, to promote extinction. However, this is, as I said, extinction is more hard to get than, uh, than uh, causing the animal more, more being more anxious. And thus, we, we use this uh, strategy of uh, making the animals more anxious. And then we look at the extinction or prefrontal cortex dependent, uh, dependent uh, um, tasks. So what we have found is that increasing, um, increasing putting the animal on elevated platform, it's like bringing you and putting you, if you have phobia from heights, then it's, you, feel, you feel anxious. And we can see that it is mild stressor. It increases uh, 
uh, all the measures of uh, physiological uh, stress, blood uh, hormones and adrenaline and corticosterone, and the animal is completely, completely frightened. And then we can examine other behaviors, so we can examine how this exposure to stress affect behavior, electrophysiology, morphology, biochemistry, and molecular, and so on. And so we know that uh, stress uh, uh, impairs or abolishes the special memory, object recognition, these tasks that are related to the hippocampus. And also it abolishes or impairs extinction of fear conditioning and thus because we are more occupied in survival and we cannot focus on, on, on uh, cognitive, cognitive tasks. We know also that exposure to stress is related to uh, to uh, changes, morphological changes in the prefrontal cortex and even one, thing, one episode of, uh, of stress is related uh, to, um, uh, to morphological uh, changes. So exposure to fear or traumatic experience increases amygdala activity, decreases functions that are related to the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex because the body, the brain and body are busy to survive and not busy to acquire new information. Now, we ask, we know that, uh, we know that uh, several uh, uh, pharmacological uh, tools uh, uh, attempted to see whether we can facilitate uh, extinction and make us less frightened. However, we ask in the lab a very simple question. Can extinction be enhanced in a behavioral paradigm? And then Bal talked about empathy. And here I'm going to talk about how to treat fear by social support in, in rats. So we developed, a, in, in my lab, we developed a, a, a paradigm of a social, it's called social extinction, in which we fear condition the animals as singles. And uh, 24 hours later, we retrieve the fear memory, and we know that these animals are frightened. However, after this retrieval, we continue with extinction, either in a single condition, either in a single uh, condition, or we put animals in pairs. So they extinguish together. So these two animals uh, uh, went fear conditioning together, and now they are extinguishing uh, together. And we have, what we have found is that this extinction resulted in pairs, resulted in facilitation of extinction, meaning that they reduce their fears more easily than, uh, than in the single condition. Now, the prefrontal cortex is very implicated in social, in social behavior, and we ask, and we know that oxytocin also, Viviana talked about oxytocin, we know that oxytocin is also involved in, in social memory. So the question that we ask whether this facilitation of extinction, this enhancement of extinction, can be related to prefrontal cortex oxytocin, and what we did, we blocked the oxytocin into, into, in uh, the prefrontal cortex, and we saw the effects on, uh, on uh, this typical social behavior or reduction of fear. And we have found that when we do this uh, in, in adult animals, male animals, we can see that it blocks, it blocks the effects that is induced by being in pairs, suggesting that uh, social facilitation or social support is mediated by prefrontal cortex oxytocin. Now, another thing of uh, the prefrontal cortex is that it evolves uh, during uh, development, which means that uh, if I can see that students here, that they are below 26 of the age, so they have still uh, ongoing uh, maturation of the prefrontal cortex. And, uh, and thus, uh, uh, studies have shown that uh, the prefrontal cortex uh, is similarly engaged in juvenile animals as compared to the adult animals. And for us, we, have, we, 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 we thought that this is something that is not uh, possible. And we have lots of data that shows that uh, the recruitment of the prefrontal cortex is different in juvenile animals than in adult animals. However, in this, uh, in this experiment, what we, have, uh, what we have asked, whether we can get similar effects of this social, uh, social effects in juvenile animals, and uh, we also asked whether uh, juvenile or female rats will show similar, uh, similar effects. So as I said, uh, studies on female animals is neglected so much, even though that uh, animals, uh, females, uh, we know that women and uh, women, especially women, they are more susceptible to, uh, to anxiety disorders. However, all the studies are conducted in the male, in the male animal. 
So what we did was uh, we blocked uh, oxytocin in the juvenile female and in the juvenile male. And as you can see, while in the male there was no effect of this blockage, the treatment did not, uh, did not affect extinction. In the female animals, you can see that it blocked extinction and it blocked also the social support by, by extinction, which means that animals, when, when uh, prefrontal cortex oxytocin is blocked, then this, the social support is not, is not uh, beneficial on extinction. So, um, uh, so this means that if you remember, uh, Leron, where is Leron? She's not here. <laughs> She's guilty. <laughs> so if you, if you remember, because I put in my, in my new presentation the, also the, uh, the figure of adult animals, you can see if you remember the effect in adult animals. So also in the effect in the adult animals, you can see that it is similar to the juvenile female animals. So here we, we, uh, we see that the juvenile male and the juvenile females are distinct and that the juvenile female is more similar to the adult male. And this is something very revolutionary because if you, because I always say, if we needed a scientific experiment or scientific evidence that girls are more mature than, than boys, then I think I'm, I'm presenting here, here. And I will show you further evidence that uh, that female juveniles are different from uh, male juveniles. So we went, we went to social recognition memory, which doesn't include any aversive, uh, uh, any aversive, uh, parad any, any aversive uh, co component. And it is very emotional for the animal because the animal is exposed in the first training session to an object and to an, uh, another animal, to another animal. And normally, because rats are very social, so they, are, they explore the social animal more than the object. Okay, 24 hours later, we expose the animals uh, to a familiar one and to a novel animal. And now the animal, if, has, if, he, if it has a good memory, then it will explore the novel one and will least explore the, the familiar one. So this is the uh, uh, social recognition memory. And what we have found is that when we block uh, uh, the prefrontal cortex in the adult, in the juvenile, sorry, in the juvenile animal, you can see that we block uh, social recognition memory and they are no longer can discriminate between the familiar one and uh, 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 the, novel, uh, the novel one. Now, when we look at, uh, at uh, juvenile females, okay, juvenile females, you can see that in juvenile females, the same treatment does not affect social recognition memory. And also, when we test adult males, we can see also that it does not affect uh, social recognition memory. So, these results, again, using another paradigm, they show that the juvenile female has similar mechanisms as the adult, as the adult male, and they are... Uh, distinct from, uh, from the juvenile uh, male. So here I, I, here I present all these data that they compare between these two paradigms and, uh, and you have the adults and you have the juveniles, uh, females and juvenile males and you can see that uh, um, uh, the, juvenile, the juvenile females have similar mechanisms like the adult males and they are distinct from uh, uh, the juvenile males. So, so to summarize here, we developed an experimental setting that shows that fear can be reduced by social support. We confirmed that the, the beneficial effect of social support on extinction is dependent on oxytocin. We also show that uh, these results, both with oxytocin and uh, 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 anisomycin, may suggest that even at prepubertal stage, we, uh, before sexual maturation, substantial differences exist between the juvenile male and juvenile females, and this should be taken into consideration when treating girls and boys suffering from anxiety or social disorders because they have different, completely different, uh, different mechanisms. So at the end, uh, 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 Nbal said that it is a group uh, uh, effort. So as you can see, it is really um, girls' power. And uh, we have uh, female-only women, wonderful women in my lab. 
And in order to have uh, a boy in my lab, who so went to, to India and we brought uh, Kuldeep uh, with us. So um, uh, I, thank, uh, I thank my students because without them, because I'm sitting in my, in my office and I'm doing uh, paperwork and they are doing the real uh, work and this wonderful, wonderful woman. And here I would like to say hi to Ilham uh, Taha. Also, she finished uh, PhD in our, uh, in our department and now she is at ELSIC here. So wishing her very good luck in her uh, career. And and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is, and this is, again, this is not the right presentation. <laughs> I'm very Polish. <laughs> <laughs> One second. Questions for Mona? So that's interesting. I think maybe Mona would like to, the, the fact that uh, male and female respond differently to drugs, and in this case, this is something even humans do that, yeah, that, that's, a, that's an interesting point that we should maybe discuss later about this. Because after all, you do an experiment and sometimes you are not aware whether it's a male or female, we should be aware of it. Anybody else wants to ask questions? It's a very quiet audience. I don't want to dominate the audience. Okay, thank you very much. So it's now the the end of Shira Tzil, she's from the Indivibri University Department of Psychology, and she will talk, uh, she will talk about growing a social brain. Show me. Hello, everyone. Um, I would like to thank uh, again the organizers who made this amazing event possible. Uh, so thank you, Idan. Thank you, Viviana, uh, and thank you, Tova and Sami, for inviting us uh, to speak here. And thank you to all the uh, previous and future speakers uh, that I'm really honored to share this stage with you. Um, and today, I would like to start with a question. So, what makes us a social species? Humans are an incredibly social species, uh, more than others, um, and sociality has been defined in many ways um, in, in the literature uh, because humans, uh, we cooperate with each other, we form pair bonds with selected individuals, and we bear and care for our children for extended periods of time. Um, so these are all definitions for social species, but today I want to define sociality or a social animal in a different way and say that social animals are animals that cannot survive without the presence of another conspecific, of someone else from the same species. Um, and so the evolutionary plan really relies not only on the biology of the individual, but it considers the presence of the physiology of other individuals in their environment. And if we think about this definition, then all birds and mammals are social to some extent because newborns cannot survive without uh, at least one dedicated caregiver. And then they depend on caregivers to regulate for them almost every aspect of their physiological uh, processes. And this is a term I call allostasis. And this includes their energy balance, their immune function, um, their temperature, their autonomic nervous system. Um, and we see that uh, caregivers invest a lot of care in regulating allostasis in their infants. We see this uh, starting from pregnancy, where the infant's uh, physiology completely depends on the caregiver. But this does not stop at once with birth. Uh, parents continue to continuously regulate their infant allostasis. They feed the infant, and by feeding, they regulate their energy, but also uh, their uh, antibodies uh, in their plasma, their immune function, their microbiota. Parents sing and touch their infant in order to regulate their temperature, to regulate their heart rate to regulate their sleep, their arousal levels. Um, and in fact, we can uh, study uh, and research parental behavior with this perspective of taking care of the infant's physiological needs. And in order for this to work, in order for infants to survive without being able to uh, independently regulate themselves, these infants must be equipped with a system that senses their fluctuations in physiological demands 
And this system uh, it is called interoception. The system of interoception is connected to a motor system that signals out uh, these physiological demands to the caregiver. And then if everything works, good, works okay, then there is a caregiver to take care of these, uh, um, of these signals. Um, in the lab, we can quantify how infants signal out uh, these physiological or these regulatory needs to their caregivers. And we use this model, this is a model of affect, uh, which was uh, presented by James Russell. Um, and we use this model of affect to describe how infants behave. So this model has two axes. Uh, the horizontal axis, it's called valence, and it moves from unpleasant to pleasant. And the uh, vertical axis is arousal, moving from low arousal to high arousal. We can think about moving leftward on the horizontal axis as a deviation from, from regulatory balance, like pain or hunger, and moving rightward as regaining regulation or even have a positive uh, uh, deviation in allostatic balance. And uh, we can think about this, uh, this um, vertical axis as the amplitude of deviation such that a negative allostasis deviation can have a mild amplitude or it can have a very dramatic amplitude and the same goes for the right side of the space. Now, um, that when everything works properly, uh, parents are super attentive uh, to, to these very subtle cues of their infant um, uh, because parents don't wait for the infant to scream. Uh, they feed them way, way before they scream because they're very attentive to very subtle cues uh, that the infant sends. And uh, we wanted to see which uh, a neural mechanism in parents enable them to be very sensitive to these regulatory demands of the infant. Um, so this is Shira. She is one of the babies in our study. Um, I'm going to press play and you will see Shira play. And you will also see how we code her behavior here with this tool. Is there a sound? When Shira is engaged and, and interested, you would see a minor deviation to the right. When Shira is frustrated, you would see a deviation to the left. upset. Now, these deviations, as I, as I said, they're very subtle, but for Shira's mom, they're super informative because they bear information about Shira's regulation. And so we put the mother in the scanner inside uh, lies a mom, and she watches a video of her own infant, and it's not just a random video, but we, we know exactly what happened uh, in terms of uh, social signaling of regulation in the movie. And so we can test how uh, these social signals in every movie can uh, 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 cause a response in the maternal brain, and we see how and where. Um, and we have uh, used in this experiment a special scanner that allows us to track uh, maternal dopaminergic responses uh, of mothers to their infants while they're watching uh, these videos. Um, and we wanted to see how uh, uh, the dopaminergic systems of mothers uh, responds or encodes uh, uh, these uh, social cues of regulation. And what we see is that when mothers observe videos that contain a lot of social signals like that, we see here uh, on the, on the x-axis, then mothers respond more dopamine. The more signals, the more dopamine in a special region, the nucleus accumbens, we can see it also here. Uh, it was mentioned before, it's called the reward circuitry. It's, uh, uh, it's associated with motivation. Um, and we know from animal, from non-human animal research, that what regulates the dopamine secretion within the circuit is actually secretion of oxytocin uh, that is secreted from the hypothalamus. So this uh, is a, a model of a brain circuit that is associated with social interaction and also with emotion, actually. And it contains the amygdala and the medial prefrontal cortex, which you've heard about already. Um, and when these perceive information about the pup, about the, the infant, they regulate the amount of dopamine secreted in the nucleus accumbens, along with oxytocinergic projections from the hypothalamus. The more oxytocin, the more dopamine are secreted within the circuit, the more the mother would perform maternal behavior with her pups. 
So this circuit uh, was uh, uh, shown in non-human and human animal research to be super important for maternal behavior, but not only for maternal behavior, also for social behavior uh, at large. And so we ask if this is a system uh, that is crucial for social interactions, does this mean that infants uh, has to be equipped with the system at birth in order to survive as a social animal? Um, and when we look at newborn's brain, we actually see that the answer is no. This is a, 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 a um, fMRI, a resting state fMRI of newborns. And what we do see intact in newborn's brain are sensory and motor control networks. What we do not see in newborns are two important features. The first is long range connections that connect distal parts of the brain. And the second is multimodal association. Multimodal association is the ability to integrate information from separate modalities and experience the world as contingent. Um, and interestingly, it is not genetically predetermined. It develops with experience after birth and it depends on the pup's environment. And so at first, infants experience the world as uh, um, just unimodal, a bunch of unimodal uh, inputs that does not make any sense and it takes them weeks to be able to converge them and experience the world in a multimodal way, the way we experience the world. This model uh, can potentially help us understand how multimodal associations are generated in the brain. We see here a, a model that contains five rings, and these rings represent cortical regions uh, depending on their level of lamination. So different types of cortex have different anat anatomical uh, uh, structures with different uh, amount of lamina. We can see on the most outer ring, the most laminated uh, types of the cortex contain all the primary sensory cortices. We see here the uh, uh, V1, the primary visual cortex, primary auditory cortex, primary somatosensory cortex. And we see that at first information is processed in a unimodal way. Then information is uh, projected to higher order cortical regions, which are less laminated. At first, uh, uh, um, unimodal information is associated in unimodal association cortices that integrate information from different inputs in the same modality. But then information is projected to multimodal association areas where information is now integrated from the different modalities. Now, multimodal integration is useful not only to experience the world as convergent, it is also useful because it enables the brain to predict. Because now when I get information from V1, I already can have a prediction about what's going to happen in this path of information. Um, and so association cortices really hold, they represent uh, rich multimodal uh, information. Um, and when sensory information is associated like this, uh, it can be grouped into categories and represented as a concept. Concept is a word that was used here before today, uh, which was really useful for me. Uh, but we can think about concepts now as multimodal associations that are generated with experience and represented in multimodal association cortices. Let's look at an example. Every four-legged animal that barks is a dog. So a dog can be, uh, um, it's, it can, it's a very uh, varied uh, um, population of sensory events. They can be big or small, they can be dark, they can be blonde, but still uh, there is enough statistical regularity among this population that enable us to categorize them and using them uh, uh, um, as one uh, dog concept. And the dog concept is useful uh, because it enables the brain to predict. It enables the brain to predict both in space and in time. It enables the brain to predict in space because when I see a dog, I, I know how they're going to sound. And it enables the brain to predict in time because I already know dogs. I have experience with dogs. My brain can predict what's going to happen. It, can, it predicts that if I see a dog, they would jump on me, they would drool. If I like dogs, I already have predictions about myself. I would want to approach the dog, or if I dislike dogs, I would maybe have a stress response. So the brain can predict in both space and in time. And a concept can be considered a probabilistic model that is learned with experience. And this is important for emotion because let's think about this little one, okay? She was just born. 
And she doesn't have any probabilistic models. She doesn't have enough sensory experience to form any multimodal association. She doesn't, uh, every, everything that she experiences is, is prediction error just simply because her brain cannot predict it. So she's tabula rasa, she doesn't know anything. And something happens while this uh, little creature interacts with a lot of social experts in her environment uh, that makes her, uh, or maybe impacts her brain and her behavior to become a social expert quite fast, actually. And within weeks or months, this little creature that doesn't know anything becomes super, super uh, uh, sophisticated in social interactions. What might that be? Um, and I want to suggest that the infant's metabolic demands um, is crucial for the development uh, of concepts and of social behaviors, and I would explain how. So, um, the special uh, evolutionary feature, whereas infants cannot survive without their caregivers, creates a special constellation whereby every time the infant is regulated, it would be in the presence of a caregiver. So this is 100% statistical regularity. This infant would never eat without another human. And if you think about it, allostasis regulation is, is really the ultimate reward, right? It's food, it's comfort. And so there is a learning constellation whereby 100% statistical regulation, every time I'm rewarded, it is associated with social information. Now this can cause three interesting things. The first is that social information becomes more and more salient and more and more rewarding uh, and, the, and the infant attaches to the caregiver. The second important thing that happens is that like all social animals, infants learn that the most efficient way for them to regulate their physiology is by social interaction. And the third thing that happens is that infants ha are high, they become super highly motivated to learn social concepts. And let's, uh, for example, think about mommy for a second um, as a learned concept. Um, this infant, she's tabula rasa, right? She doesn't know anything. But with repeated care, uh, she acquires repeated experience that associate the exteroceptive information about mommy, how mommy smells, how mommy sounds, how mommy feels like, to the interoceptive information about her own physiology. And so within, let's say, say four or five days, this infant already had hundreds of trials learning that this exteroceptive information is very useful uh, for her own uh, purposes. And uh, uh, the mommy concept starts to construct with learning and becomes very uh, um, efficient because it enables this infant to predict. Now just by hearing mommy's voice, this baby already has predictions about her upcoming changes in her glucose levels. She can start to secrete insulin, she can start to behave accordingly with suckling behavior and so on. And, um, and, and the same mechanism, or using the same mechanism, infants can also acquire more abstract concepts, such as emotion concepts. Um, and this is because parents associate abstract ideas to very concrete experiences of allostasis. And so if the infant repeatedly have this uh, affective experience uh, that she feels that has to do with her own body and with the context, and every time she feels uh, this set of experiences, the caregiver tags it with a word. And so an entirely abstract stimulus, like a word, becomes very meaningful because it is associated with allostasis, basically. Um, and just like the dog concept, emotion concepts, they're not uh, a prototypical uh, event. There are a series of populations uh, where uh, uh, a series of events uh, that parents tag uh, with uh, this abstract idea or a concept become very meaningful. Uh, they have a lot of, uh, uh, of utility because as we said, uh, concepts are useful because they enable the brain to predict. Uh, and just like uh, Maya described, just by using a concept, just by having a concept of an emotion, uh, this already has some uh, regulatory features because it helps the brain to predict, to anticipate, and to organize this allostatic uh, uh, experience uh, that uh, happens within their body and what's going to happen next in social interactions and in the environment. And so, um, like all multisensory events, um, multi uh, uh, emotion concepts, are represented in multimodal association areas. 
they are acquired by learning. Uh, and, uh, uh, and when, if we look at the association cortices, at multimodal association cortices in the brain that we know are associated with emotion processing and with social processing. For this, uh, in this example, it's the anterior insula, the anterior part of the insula. And if we look at the anatomy of this region and we look where it's connected to, we see that it's actually connected to all types of primary sensory cortices. We see here the somatosensory cortex, the V1, and it is also connected to the primary interoceptive cortex in the posterior part of the insula. And we think or propose uh, the hypothesis that perhaps when we see this anterior insula uh, um, activation uh, uh, during an emotional task, perhaps what it's doing is integrating and predicting uh, information that is associated from interoceptive sources and from extraceptive sources. Uh, and this is true not only for the insula. We see that neural uh, uh, circuits that participate in emotion processing include regions that has to do with control of allostasis in the body, regions that uh, are coordinate sensory information and motor control, and these are all integrated in association cortices in different parts of the brain, um, some of them you can see here. Um, and given such an efficient learning environment, uh, we want to propose, again, the hypothesis that uh, we see that newborns are born without this infrastructure that supports emotion processing in adults, and we know that they develop it uh, um, while this happens repeatedly. Um, and so these are circumstantial evidence that while this happened, this also happened. But there are also hard mechanistic evidence that show that experience in early life, and especially with, in the context of care uh, by the caregiver, determines the phenotype, the function of the brain in these regions and in these circuits in adults in a long-lasting way. Um, and with that, I would end. I would thank you for your attention and my lab members. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? <laughs> There. What you are saying would be very interesting for parents to know and to learn. How can you put your theory into practice? What should be changed in parents? Uh, behavior toward babies and how can we teach them to be better parents to allow their babies to grow a better system? Thank you Viviana, it's an excellent question and a question that I think about a lot. Uh, I think that once we make, um, first of all give the, the parents uh, the confirmation that regulating allostasis of another human being is very hard. You know, when we regulate the losses of our own body, when we are hungry, our brain has receptors that knows that. But we, when we need to regulate hunger or pain or any other need in another human being, it's very hard. We need to be very attentive. We need to, to be very active about it. And so I think, first of all, giving parents the confirmation that regulating allostasis 24-7 in an infant um, is a very robust uh, uh, task, that's one thing. Another thing is to is to provide parents with the tools that help them even understand that this is what they're doing because parents are not necessarily aware uh, that uh, this is what they're doing, how time consuming it is, how uh, anxiety uh, uh, raising that could be. Um, and so uh, this is one thing, this is the second thing. The third thing is that we can, uh, the same uh, way we measure how infants behave with their parents, we also measure how mothers and fathers regulate their infants. Fathers and mothers use specific strategies to regulate the infant's allostasis, and we know what strategies are more uh, uh, efficient and what less, and we can uh, educate parents about that. Yes, please. No, me. Uh, did you uh, ever look at the effects of siblings or the role of siblings in this uh, type of learning? 
Not yet. Uh, right now, all of this research is mainly uh, based on mothers, uh, up in line are fathers. And uh, siblings are also super important, I think, especially in the, uh, a little uh, later ages. Maybe one more follow up. Um, and I mean, coming from the guilt of a mother, so how would that compare to a caregiver who's not a parent? That's a really good question, too. Um, I think that, uh, so my educated guess or hypothesis would be that anyone who's very attentive um, and very uh, focused at regulating the infant's allostasis uh, would do it perfectly. So I don't think, uh, I think that pregnancy and birth uh, provides a mother with a certain advantage in being in that uh, specific mindset that helps her be very focused on her infant because when she breastfeeds the, the, the infant, it also regulates her own allostasis. But if it's an adoptive parent or a father, uh, I think they can get there quite quickly. So once you have a baby put in your lap telling you you're in charge of their life, you simply perform. And I think once you perform, the parent's brain are a plastic as well, and I think they would uh, um, perform as well. Uh, it doesn't have to be mommy. Thank you. I want to ask about the personality disorders that uh, probably uh, occur at these early stages of bonding. And if you think that there is any option of repairing this system uh, at the elder stages, so yes, I think um, the brain is plastic, as I said. I think I don't like to think about it as deterministic. Um, it is true that um, I think infants learn the quickest the more they are dependent on their caregivers. Um, once infant, so th this huge dependency on your caregiver gives you a very robust motivation to learn. And this is what, why what you learn at very early age uh, is very stable and it's very hard to change it later on because later on human beings become less dependent on their caregivers so their motivation for learning is not life or death now and the learning uh, our curve I think slows down um, but I but the brain continues to be plastic and with repeated exposure uh, I think I definitely believe that you can repair um, maladaptive concepts that were constructed in early ages Uh, I wanted to ask about, you said that it's not born, this social interaction, but uh, breastfeeding is immediate, right? So, um, Thanks. I think, of course, there are features that are uh, has to be innate. Um, I am just um, want to suggest that these features are very domain general. So um, it, it is enough to be born with a dependency in, in feeding and with a certain reflex in your, in your lips. You don't have to be born with knowledge about faces or with knowledge about mommy or with um, these kind of more complex social concepts. I think it's not, there, there is a more parsimonious explanation because you can just make this creature in, in, uh, dependent in their caregivers and then you don't have to imbue all this sophisticated knowledge genetically. So of course there are features that has to be innate. For example, interoception, connection to a motor uh, system, all this has to be innate. The ability to learn has to be innate. Um, the, the of course specific behavior such as suckling behavior has to be innate otherwise um, there is no time to learn how to breastfeed. You, has to, you have to breastfeed once you're born. Um, I just think that the innate features are much more domain general that is uh, usually considered. Very much here. Yeah. Uh, I remind you that we will have a, a brief uh, a round table discussion, so prepare questions also for the other speakers. So the last one is our uh, beloved Mona Sorek from the center here. Mona is a molecular biologist, uh, but doing many other things. Uh, and she will talk about, uh, oh, sorry? Repressed emotion and PTSD. Thank you. I lost in the capital of Iran.
העברתי את המצגת והם לא טענו אותה. Okay, maybe we'll start without, without a presentation. And we'll, we'll get there when the presentation comes here. So I was asked to talk about uh, the power of repressing emotions. And I believe that the Israeli society has been one that repressed emotions vigorously, forcefully, at least uh, at the early years of the State of Israel when that was deemed essential for the survival of the state. So men definitely, but also women were not expected to show emotions. Even if a soldier died, you were not supposed to cry. You were not supposed to show any, any uh, emotional reaction that was conceived as being weak. And that went all the way towards a culture saying, this is the way you need to live. And the way out of that would be relate to people like you, who also lost someone, and you, they will understand you. So that solves the problem of repressing emotions. I, I can tell you of a, a day when we, we are a, a family that lost a soldier. My, a, a, the sister of my husband was killed in a traffic accident while being a soldier. And I remember the funeral and my father-in-law was saying the, the most important sentence for him was the last one, saying there, would, there should be peace. Years after, <clears throat> we were driving next to the house of my parents-in-law <clears throat> and my, my son was five years old, and the apartment was dark. And I said, look up, uh, grandma and grandpa are not at home. And he said, oh yeah, they probably went to a funeral or a memorial service. He was five years old. And I decided that we will not support this culture of death at home. I didn't take the kids to the... Uh, cemetery, I didn't take them to memorial services, and I did it so effectively that years after when my youngest son became 11 and they had a lesson in school studying about that, he said, Mommy, do we know any family who lost someone? And then I realized that I overdid it. So repressing emotions has been a culture here. <clears throat> I'm not sure that that was the, of benefit to the people. And definitely not for those who suffer the severe uh, outcome of such repression. My apologies. I didn't realize that I was supposed to rebring it over here. <coughs> OK. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. So we are going to talk about emotional responses as protective mechanisms. And I think at least part of this study was made possible ever since I joined the Edmund and Lily Safra Center for Neuroscience because I met people from other disciplines in this field. And I believe that combining different expertise 
is essential for addressing such heavy matters. So we are talking about something that happens in the network of our neurons and post-traumatic stress disorder. It has been longed for, known for a long time, ever since Walter Cannon uh, discovered it so seemingly, but actually if we look back in history, Herodotus told us about the Battle of Marathon, about this brave soldier who was manly and brave as soldiers should be, and then he lost his eyesight and remained blind forever after. So this is definitely a description, not only of PTSD, but of PTSD, which is associated with a physical presentation. It doesn't only affect the brain, it affects body functions as well. Guernica by Picasso definitely shows us the impact of post-traumatic reactions, and so does Walsh with Bashir in our society. <clears throat> but what we need to remember is that PTSD involves re-experiencing, but also arousal and avoidance behavior, and pro-inflammatory reactions, which are something else. So we cannot say PTSD is a problem of the brain and nothing beyond that is relevant. That's not reliable anymore. And what I'd like to talk about today is this uh, association between the suppressed emotions and the inflammatory reactions. And I'd like to offer one chemical as relevant, and this is acetylcholine which was discovered by Otto Lowy, then at the University in Graz. And uh, what he showed is that acetylcholine, as a chemical, activates neuronal networks. Until then, it was known. The concept was there is electricity going through the synapse. And suddenly we learn that chemicals can do this. And acetylcholine controls both brain processes and a communication with the body, including fear reactions. And again, if we go back to history, Seneca told us many, many years ago that everyone is slave to something. We are slaves to the admiration of science, maybe. We like to go to conferences. We appreciate when there are real people there, not only telephones. So, yeah. But all human beings are slaves to fear, and we need to respect that. And I believe that acetylcholine and its capacity to communicate between brain and body is highly relevant. Definitely, this also goes to genes. And I'm probably the only one here who mentions this uh, dirty word, so our uh, chromosomes include genes, this is the DNA, which is transcribed to RNA, that yields the proteins, and there is more to them than that. So I'd like to tell you about the cholinesterase genes, which terminate the acetylcholine signals, and therefore are very important for it. And this is a, a Alon Simchovich, who has been a PhD student in the lab while doing his MD studies, and now is one of those interns that hopefully will have shorter shifts, which is good. So uh, years ago, we discovered a mutation in one of the cholinesterase genes, and we warned the person, we, is me and the clinicians with whom I was collaborating, that he should be really careful from taking any medications that affect the cholinergic system. That was many years ago. We did not predict the Gulf War. And in the Gulf War, I was actually sitting with a mask. So we didn't invent masks in this pandemic. And his father calls me and says that his son, who is a soldier, suffered severe psychological collapse and he doesn't know what happened. And I said, did he take the pills that the army gives all soldiers? Which I knew from my, my own son who was a soldier then. 
And he says, yes, and I said, I think that that's the problem, because those drugs were expected to protect our soldiers from chemical warfare, and they attacked the same cholinergic pathway. And uh, the poor carrier of this mutation was sent to a psychiatrist, he got more drugs, he felt even worse, he stopped taking all drugs, was released from the army and completed PhD in computation, so he's doing okay. But that means that there might be carriers of mutations that might be very sensitive to changes in a cholinergic pathway. The uh, brain on the screen shows you a brain mapping of people who just happen to live next to sprayed orchards because insecticides block the cholinergic pathway. And the uh, frontal lobe shown in red is hyperactive. The deep brain nuclei are hypoactive. They show learning and memory impairments just because they live next to a sprayed region. So insecticides target the cholinergic system of the insect, but we share 50% of the sequence of those genes. So that's not very healthy. If you see a spraying airplane, go away. Don't, don't stand beneath that. In addition to such mutations, we also have mutations in non-coding regions of these genes. And that was a mystery. What is different in those genes? We also know that men and women react differently to drugs affecting the cholinergic system. Again, what is showing? Part of the answer was discovered when microRNAs were found. And Craig Mello and Andrew Fire won the Nobel Prize for that discovery in 2006. And what they showed is that when a DNA gets to be an RNA, that RNA may be blocked, the functioning may be blocked by microRNAs, which are very small, very effective, target regions that do not encode anything. So actually, we have here a new mechanism of action that might control the uh, cholinergic system. So can we look at that in men and women? And I thank Mona Maroon for opening that uh, issue. And what we did recently, together with Sebastian Lobentanzer, who adopted me and our center and came to our retreat here and collaborated with me via internet until I got a message from Frankfurt University that you are the supervisor of this student, which I didn't even know. And uh, he collaborated with Geula Hanin at our lab who did the experiments while he did the analysis of data. And we looked at the genes and the microRNAs expressed by men and women with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And what we found are changes in the cholinergic pathway. So true, as Mona told you, there are differences between men and women, and at least part of that is due to the changes in the expression of these little controllers, microRNAs, in their brain. So is that reflected in the treatment? Actually, PTSD drugs affect the brain, as one would expect, but they also affect the body. And we can't ignore that either. This is Karen Ofek, that was her PhD topic. And then we decided to create mice where microRNA control would not be allowed. So what we did was to overexpress the gene we cloned, the acetylcholinesterase gene, and we took off the region that reacts to microRNAs. So that gene will be overexpressed consistently. And uh, we looked at the brain, the behavior, and the inflammatory system of these mice. And what we found was that the mice keep running all the time. You would say that's physical activity, this is very good. But it's not very good because in serial maze, they totally failed. So they are both hyperactive and stupid. And they have 
huge inflammation in the intestinal system. So we checked that. We, in that case, is Shanish and Har, today at Tel Aviv University. She was a postdoc here at ELSEC. And what she did was to look for the corresponding microRNAs in the intestinal tissues removed in patients with Crohn's disease. And she found an order of magnitude elevation of those microRNAs, which keeps reminding me that the initial publications on smoking was this calms you down. You know, surgeons were photographed showing, you know, after surgery I smoke because that makes me feel better. Maybe it made them feel better, but it wasn't a calming reaction. Okay. So can we look at the brain of post-traumatic patients? So uh, Gabby Zimmerman in the lab looked at the brain volumes in patients from the Soroka Medical Center. This was a collaborative study with Alon Friedman and showed declined hippocampal volume, increased pituitary volume, and thinning of the cerebral cortex, which is characteristic of aging brains and associates with weakened uh, uh, cognition. So inflammatory markers may correlate with post-traumatic system severity. How common is this? We know about a lot of famous individuals who were PTSD patients or are. Woody Allen, Mark Twain, Winston Churchill, Princess Diana, Virginia Woolf, Leonard Cohen. I can tell you about a cousin of mine who was a, a 80 years old. He fell and his wife called the paramedics and they found a cardiac issue and treated that, but they didn't detect a bleeding in the brain and he lost the capacity to speak. So for the next two years until he passed away, he was, a, a, couldn't speak. What he did was to press with one finger the other hand and his wife ignored that until a friend who served with him in the army came and said he's sending Morse messages. He says, and that was his job in our unit in the army in 73, he says we are under the bridge, come save us. And thanks to that message they did come and save us. And this guy, this was 40 years after, even more. And he was a wonderful family person and a businessman and a, an artist. The only thing we knew about him is that he can't sleep. So he didn't sleep at night. And now I, I'm sure that he was a PTSD patient and that there are many such patients among us. So cholinergic signaling talks to inflammation and vice versa. And this is a vicious circle that we need to know about, realize, and take care of. So how can you check the impact of stressful experiences at a population level? You can find a lot of stories about someone who was exposed to a tsunami and developed a heart attack and dropped dead. Someone else uh, was part of a terrible earthquake. And in all of these anecdotal papers, you find a statement, this cannot be looked at at the population level because there are not, no populations that are consistently stressed. Well, I have an arguing with this statement. I think we all know a population that is consistently stressed. And uh, we decided to check that, again, together with Tel Aviv University researchers. And we used an old Chinese method, just measuring one's pulse. So you can put your thumb on the other hand and count the number of heartbeats per minute. For grown-ups, it should be around 60, and it should stay that way. If it goes up, that's a bad sign. You need to go to your family clinician and get treated for that. So what we've done is to look at 18,000 people who come 
in Tel Aviv for medical checkups every year for which the company pays. So Arabs and Jews and Christians and men and women, 18,000 people for four years. And in addition to their documents, they were asked to answer a questionnaire with questions like, to what extent do you fear the impact of terror on your daily life? And what we discovered, and that's again Shanish and Hal's discovery, is that those people who answered five out of five about fear of terror were those with the highest inflammatory markers. So there is an association which needed machine learning and 18,000 people, but showed clearly that there are populations under stress. You know, we had this uh, conference in, in the Brain Center recently in Neveilan, and we all sat there and like it was a big event, the new coming center and real meeting with real people. And then the organizer gets up and says, okay, we just heard there is a fire, we need to clear up the hall. And within 10 minutes, everyone took someone else to Tel Aviv or Jerusalem and the hall was evacuated because we are a population under consistent stress and we need to react to realize that. So, are microRNAs the end of the story? No, we have recently found that breakdown products of transfer RNA, which is a benign molecule bringing amino acid to, to build new proteins, actually operate like microRNAs and that under stressful situation like post-stroke blood cells would show a huge elevation of those fragments and microRNAs go down. So I would say the body or the biological system realizes that under acute conditions you need a different set of regulation. Talk about that to us with our masks. So this is a Kasia Winek, a postdoc in the lab, which uh, published this paper very recently together with the same Sebastian Lobentanzer who again did the analysis. So how can we look for the genes and transcripts correlating this? So uh, this is Nadav Yayon, who is now at Cambridge for his postdoc, but we are still correcting his paper, where he looked for the uh, structural aspects and genes that control emotional reactions in juvenile mice. What you do is you take a seven days old mouse, a little bit older than the babies uh, Shiratzil was telling us about, and you clip off the whiskers in one part of the face. That's all. Three months later, these mice are discriminated against. They are in social interactions, they are put down at, they are always the subordinate in any social interaction. And what we've done was to look at the uh, structure of their cholinergic neurons and the genes those neurons express. And what we see is a change in the network of genes in the barrel cortex that controls this a, a clipping of the whiskers, and we now have our fingers on the very genes that are responsible for changing the structure of these uh, nerve cells. So, that was a long story in a short time, but as uh, we heard before, it's not my story, it's our story. It's a mystery, I like detective stories, so I mourn the passing of John Le Carré. But it was handled by students and postdocs that are extremely talented and I think supported by the multidisciplinary interactions that are offered to all of us at the Brain Center. Certainly you need the financial support, so a lot of foundations are re relevant. And I told you about acetylcholine, about microRNAs, and mutations that impair their function. 
the newest discovery of fragments of transfer RNA and the population impact that we are now looking at in the context of aging as well, thinking that these RNAs are all so small that they can become therapeutic targets. And RNA therapeutics is not a bad word anymore. Everyone knows what RNA is or asks me. I, I've been involved with a lot of discussions on that. And I thank all of you for listening. Wonderful, thank you. Questions, quick questions? I wanted to ask you, Mona, I know a little bit about this Netherlands Brain Bank. Can you say something about that? Because yeah. it's an interesting thing, this. Yeah. The Netherlands Brain Bank is a very important organization, and uh, we can send them a small sort of application and say, we need brain samples or blood samples from patients with Alzheimer's disease, with uh, schizophrenia, with bipolar disorder, Parkinson. And, and they ask us uh, to cover the shipment. So they call it donation because they are an, an institution, a non-for-profit institution. And I already uh, stumbled on a problem with the supply department because I asked the Hebrew University to donate $1,500 to this Netherlands organization. And someone called me and says, lady, the Hebrew University receives donation. It doesn't donate. <laughs> so uh, that's a great organization. I don't think it can exist in a country like ours where autopsy is almost not existing. But it does help research tremendously. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. We'll, be a, we'll, we'll have 10 minutes discussion. There are some issues that I would like to discuss. So please, all the speakers, if you can approach the podium and sit there. <coughs> Mona and Shir and Muna. And you, if you have specific questions, uh, be prepared for that. So is there any, anybody from the audience who would like to ask a question of something that, that bothers him or her related to emotions, something you want to know or ask? Because this, you know, this is a unique group of experts that you might want to consider asking questions about emotions or the research of emotions. Uh, otherwise, otherwise, I will ask, uh, I, I will mention, I, I mentioned something that uh, Shir, I think, did not like. Uh, 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 and then this was the issue that I read about this PNAS paper from the Berkeley group about the, the 27 emotion types. And uh, you mentioned that you, you have uh, some, some disagreement or some... some so, so would you like to say what, what, what is the point about... Because, you know, when I read it, I said, wow, that's interesting, we have 27 emotions. Because after all, these are words that are trying to, to encompass something that we all decide to call it, a fear, or I don't know what, compassion. But you didn't like this kind of uh, setting measures or setting names or numbers to number of emotions, but I'd like to hear why. We didn't have time to discuss it. So maybe the audience would like to know. Um, so the reason why I am concerned about this kind of um, conceptualizations is because I think um, it's because of what Maya said at the beginning of the day that emotions are not natural entities. And when we, th when we declare there are 27 emotions, um, then people might uh, be confused and think that there are 27 neural programs that are separate from one another, um, that, that they do not overlap, um, that exist in the brain, and, and with them we can play. And I don't disregard the fact that we have 27 or whatever emotional, you know, words, of course. The phenomena is there at the level of language, at the level of, um, you know, conceptual description, uh, which is fine. Humans can, can conceptualize in very rich and different ways. Um, but when you say that I measured and I mapped 
the emotion, uh, um, um, you know, um, space, and I discovered 27 emotions, I think that might be misleading uh, to think that these are natural entities. He was your supervisor, no? <laughs> <laughs> We can. Uh, it's actually on. Jerry, Jerry. Yeah. So actually, uh, it's true. Uh, the Dr. Keltner uh, was my spiritual uh, mentor uh, in Berkeley, and um, he was a student of Paul Ekman. And it's uh, there are definitely two different uh, uh, schools that are thinking about emotions in those different ways. And I think that the Paul Ekman, the, the more, the, the more old fashioned, if you will, a view of emotions is one where there's just a standardized set and it's universal. And, uh, and uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett, who uh, actually brought into question this view in a very, very compelling a set of arguments that I, I actually totally agree with. Uh, yet I, it, you know, and I, I do think uh, there is value in stripping away the more high-level semantic uh, labels that we attach. And we can't really ignore the fact that there is a universal and evolutionary continuum to this phenomena that we're seeing even across species. That being said, you know, I, I totally agree with Shia. I think that uh, uh, trying to, or putting a focus on, on uh, all these different, slightly different uh, words has actually brought a lot of confusion into our field as neuroscientists when we're trying to understand the biological processes of these behaviors. So for example, in the field of empathy, you have all these words like sympathy, compassion, empathic concern, emotional contagion, uh, affective resonance, all these words that at the end of the day, just, you know, they throw us off track. And, uh, and if you strip away all those words and take a more biologically focused approach, trying to see, you know, actually what's happening in the body and the brain when we are seeing somebody in distress, we're activating this aversive arousal. And then there is a, a pro-social drive that we, can, we know how these things are occurring in the brain of humans and animals that can lead us to a more uh, useful view of how these things are happening and what's influencing those things. And perhaps the Bible even realized that because the, descript the biblical description of emotion is hamub nei me'av. They, they talk about intestinal response as part of an emotional process. Or yatsa levavo, again. Ke'ev so, lev. Yeah, ke'ev lev, right. We have a lot of terms that relate to body reactions to emotional uh, experiences. I must say that when I read this paper on 27 emotions, I was immediately checking myself if I have 27 emotions. <laughs> myself. For example, there was this emotion awe. A-W-E. What is awe? Do I have awe? <laughs> what is awe? So in some sense, the fact that you characterize certain set of emotions, whether you agree or not, in, you know, immediately because of this feedback with the environment. So this, this immediately, uh, uh, you know, forced me to think, can I characterize within myself, independent of research? So some of them, I, I, I don't even know what it, what it means because I guess I didn't ever, you know, experience or or something like that. Can you, yeah, of course. Can you, can you hear? You have awe because you're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, I, have, I have two things to say. One um, is that emotions ha are complex and they're, and they're multi-level. And one thing that um, we should have said and perhaps we didn't is that there is a difference between affect and feelings and emotions. And there is a difference, in, and in Bell mentioned this, between you know, certain biological systems and, and 
the um, and, and things like empathy, right? And so I. I so affect, okay, so, let, so yeah, so let me, let me draw a distinction and then go back to what Inbal said because I think it's important and then, and then go back, loop back to the 27 questions, but you can stop me if I speak too much. Um, so affect is, um, it is potentially a biological entity. Um, it, and perhaps, we don't know for sure, but there's some evidence to suggest that it is. And, it, and, and she talked about this and it involves valence, so that's pleasure versus pain and arousal, which is potentially intensity or, or um, significance. And these two things, um, we can track them to biological systems. They are potentially evolutionarily um, developed. They do have a function and they are a component in emotions. So when I feel fear, it's probably a state, oftentimes, but not always, when I feel negative, I feel some pain, um, and it's relatively high urgency. And we, when we, as, as, as lay people, when we talk about emotions, often what we, what we mean is feelings. But feelings and emotions are not the same. So feeling some degree of unpleasantness um, and arousal doesn't necessarily imply that we experience fear. And I think what many of us here, I'm, I'm impressed by how many of us, share the same um, assumption that emotions involve to some extent an act of conceptualization. So we look at these, we, we consider the things that are happening in our brains and in our bodies and the level of affect that we're experiencing, our feelings, and we give meaning to them. And our assumption is that that act of, of giving meaning is what emotions actually are. That's what distinguishes between anger and fear, for instance. Both of them are negative, both of them signal high urgency, but we conceptualize them in different ways. Now the reason, perhaps, and I'm putting words in Shield's mouth, but the reason why we are um, cautious about um, arguing that there's a certain number of uh, emotions, and at some point it was six, and later it was seven, and today it's 27, that's, that's great. Um, the reason that we're concerned about this is because if emotions are conceptions, they're conceptualizations, they can be conceptualized in, in, in an endless number of ways. And so you can talk about awe, and awe is a feeling that we understand in some cultures and maybe not in others. And in other cultures, they can talk about schadenfreude, which may or may not be an emotion. And we can, and you know, I, we can make up words. There's actually a dictionary of made up words um, for new emotions. And as long as we have as people the ability to conceptualize, and I think that's exactly what language is. It's the ability to create meaning um, in very um, creative and novel ways. There will be an endless number of emotions. They could be made up of biological components, but they're not equivalent to biological components. And we can't constrain the number of thoughts and ideas that people have, which are, in fact, emotions. Just one last point. There is individual differences in emotional granularity. This is work that Lisa Barrett has done, showing that some people have more emotion concepts than others. So some people are highly emotional granular and some people are less. And so that not only differs between cultures and countries, it also differs between individuals. By the way, how will, you how will you distinguish in Hebrew between emotions and feelings? We don't. You see? It's a matter of words, no? Because everybody, you speak naturally about feeling and emotion, and I think about an Israeli who doesn't have this distinction. So what, what does it mean? Not to speak about the emphatic. So, language, language. <laughs> But that's exactly my point. You know, we're all um, constrained within our language and the ideas that our language allow us to, I mean, our language is, a, is, is our way of seeing the world. But if we move away from our language, we can see that there are other ways But is that part the of, so of like the research like of emotions? Be, because for example, in vision, there are some objective things in the physics of the world. You know, certain frequency is blue. So I can objectively say that. But your blue is not my no, blue. No, no, at least. This, at least this is a great example. You know why? Because blue 
No, no, it's no, not no. a category physically. No, no. Blue is a language category, and it's the same like affect and emotion. I'm, I'm saying that outside of the outside physical world, you can define frequencies of light. Doesn't matter the, the word. I'm saying later on, no, we, you assign a word to this frequency, but at least the input is clear. You assign a, a word to a frequency, and you determine the the the, the, the limitation of, of of blue, the, right? The, the and some yeah. the boundaries, and some cultures set the boundaries a little bit different. That's true, that's so that's true. and you. Yes. Well, I'm only asking whether it's studying emotions as an additional complexity because it's more, dif more difficult yes, to define definitely. what is the input and so forth. So, so when you say fear, I, yes. I study fear. I don't study this frequency in the outside world. I study something. So there are internal. studies that so try to compare between cultures how they define but different feelings to certain emotion categories. Um, I think yeah, the field is very busy doing that exactly. Similar. You don't, we don't have a scale for smell, although, although Noam Sober in Weizmann is trying to do a scale, so like, like a frequency scale for auditory or for vision, a, smell for, a scale for smell. It's hard to do a, smell, a scale for emotion. But I'd like to hear the experts. So a, a, any comments? They say even regarding fear that I presented and uh, it's commonly freezing. But today there is also a debate uh, regarding whether freezing is really an expression of fear because even sometime, sometimes even a very frightened uh, animal can express its behavior in the opposite action of even increased uh, locomotion activity rather than freezing. So, so I think... So I think uh, Putting 27 emotions that I agree with you that even for me, I didn't understand the word that uh, you pronounced. Oh, 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 oh. even ah, it could be aha, it could be something, uh, something different. It could be aha, strange, aha, um, comfort, uh, and different aspects. So I think uh, limiting to 27, I think it's, it's just underestimating the human nature. I don't think that they suggested that there are 27 emotions. No, I don't think you... Uh, no, I think uh, they had a set of stimuli, and from this set of stimuli they claimed that 27 words represent all the emotions. They actually presented with many more emotions, I don't remember now how many, and they did some computation and it clustered into 27 that are similar. So don't rephrase it. I think we should be careful. It, I don't think this paper, if, I, if we talk about Colner and... Uh, yes, the DNA aspect. Yes, so I think they, the only claim is that we can group our semantic representations of emotions into some uh, uh, common uh, representations that if you ask me now, we can go and look at the brain if this will be more commonly also or or similarly presented in the brain. This is what I would like to do, mm -hmm. the next step. But the, I don't think it was implied that this is the, the, the space of our emotional expression. So it's just, a, actually it's a very methodological paper just to show us how we can use language to uh, extract the, the clusters of emotions that come together somehow. And, and yeah, it, it, it's still helpful that we have this 27, we can go back to that and work there, but it's definitely not, inf this is it, all no, of it. And not. I just want to, I'm not sure what was the question, sorry, I, I, no, <laughs> I no. missed the beginning, but um, maybe about, sc about the scale, I would like to argue, in fact, that maybe the scale in emotions could be um, some uh, combination of these different processes that are involved. So if we think that we have, like my suggestion, and I think others kind of reflected on it as well, that we have affect, which is a little bit more somatic and, and more automatic, and then we have the conceptualization and, and the behavior. So looking at clinical cases, it seems that people, the different clinical phenomena, different clinical um, 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 categories actually present different dominance of these components. So this might suggest that we could come up with a scale that is uh, built out of these 
different processes. I'm not, uh, not sure that these are only three processes, but at least three processes. Uh, and we um, tend to uh, um, rely on these different processes in a different way. And uh, this might be a, a way to go about. Oh, oh. No, I suddenly realized that 3 to the power of 3 is 27. No? Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. your mathematics. So, so before ending, so if, if anybody of you wants, I, I, I guess it would be for me interested, what is the next step in, in emotional research? What is the big question? What would you like to understand? I know it's a big question and maybe we need more time, but what, what is the open big questions? You know, if you would ask me in computation or machine learning, I can say something. But in, in your field, what is the tools or what are the issues that you feel needed a progress in the, let's say, the 10 next years or something like that? If, if, if you can answer this, or maybe it's too demanding. I don't know. I, I think that in the... I don't think it works. Oh, it is. Okay. In, in the past century, when suddenly electrical engineers wanted to do neuroscience, they probably asked the same question. What does it have to do in a field that was neuroanatomy and a little bit psychology? So now we know it's an embedded uh, part. And, and that's what I refer to about the value of LSEC to my activities in realizing the different approaches. And I think that we are seeing over the past maybe 20 years already, uh, the a combination of psychological questioning and specialties with the classical neuroscience. It's, it's definitely complicated, and it probably would depend also on computational approaches. But it's up and coming, and I think that that's, that would be the next heavy goal. So I, like everything nowadays, I think data. <laughs> Uh, and this is actually, I think, w could be really amazing for emotional emotion research. And for me, this is really like a, a miracle that happens that we can um, monitor our behavior and expressions in much more detailed uh, manner and also do something with it. It's not only that we can gather data, we have better tools to make sense of it. And this paper is trying to kind of guide to this direction uh, and it's from verbal output to motor output and in the middle all the um, all the physiological measures that uh, goes along with it so I think I hope this will help us uh, be a little bit smarter about uh, how people feel emotions or express emotions and uh, regulate emotions this is my hope and the other thing is computational, it's true, and it's getting very strong in our field also, the computational psychiatry, computational psychology, and um, now we all talk about predictions, but I think there is more than that. But the bottom line of it is that we might get some parameters. And that's again, as a psychiatrist, from a clinical point of view, uh, it might help us get closer to some kind of an objective measure or something that we can monitor in a little bit more uh, quantitative uh, manner and not only by self-reports because these parameters that this model model based parameters that we develop could be also based on physiological measures not only on our verbal output so this is the two things that I th I'm sure will change it but it will take some time <laughs> Are we approaching, maybe if you, if you, you know, we built a vision machine, so a machine that learn and can see, so to speak, you know, all these automated cars and, and robotics and so, are we close or not close, maybe will be close when you will understand the mechanism to build emotional machines, as we are. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much. We have, we have, we have a violin for ending. Thank you, all of you. It was really spectacular talks, very to the point, very interesting. Thank you very much. A violin and then ending.